this video was originally recorded April 2016 during the ongoing Force for Good class series happening in New York City and online each year. To learn more about this ongoing series, visit TibetHouse.us. Welcome everybody. It's great to have you here. So, um, yeah, I thought I would just briefly uh, refresh your memory as to what the agenda will be for the four sessions, this being the introductory session, and then there will be three sessions after that going into more detail. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, I've, I teach uh, a lot of different courses on Buddhism at, up at Columbia University. Um, I also teach in Dharma centers and then at places like Tibet House, work on a lot of the publications at Tibet House and translations of Tibetan texts also at Columbia and have been uh, studying and practicing Dharma for almost 40 years, started in about 78. Studied with a lot of different lamas in the Sakya tradition in the Seattle area where I'm from, and a lot in the Galuk tradition, um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and others. And then actually the Sakya lamas I studied with in Seattle were very big into Rime or non-sectarian. So they, back in the, in the days, in the 70s and 80s, when the, so many of the older lamas were still alive, I had the good fortune of studying with Kala Rinpoche and others from the Kagyu tradition. Um, various lamas from the Nyingma tradition. So had a you know, pretty well-rounded background from lamas from all four traditions and then had the good fortune to also study it academically and get the PhD at Columbia. So I'm coming at these topics from both sides. Um, I'm used to talk, talking from either side. And uh, tonight um, in this series I'll be focusing, I'll be grounded in uh, academic sort of rigor and background and, and text and so forth and history. But the emphasis in these talks will be um, somewhat more personal on the practice side for those of you who are interested in practicing, so a little bit of both. So uh, just briefly, just to read what we're going to be covering, the Buddhist uh, higher education, it's called, Adi Shiksha, is traditionally divided into the interconnected disciplines of ethics, wisdom, philosophy, and meditation, or experiential cultivation. We'll be talking about all three of those and their relationship in just a minute. Um, I will be, you know, theory and practice, I'll be bringing back in all this background to this. Um, so that's what I just said. And then the introductory session will be an overview of the ethics of each of the three vehicles. I'll be discussing in just a minute what the three vehicles of Buddhism are. In addition to covering uh, key specifics of each, we're going to explore how these different vehicles form a coherent systematic progression enabling practitioners to build on and expand their ethical understandings and commitments as they mature through the vehicles. And then session two, which will be down at Jewel Heart. I hope everyone comes to all four sessions. Session two this Thursday will be down at Jewel Heart where we'll be focusing on the first of the three vehicles, so the ethics related to the individual vehicle. This will focus on developing a deeper, more nuanced and practical understanding of the foundational exoteric attitudes and practice of what's called renunciation taking refuge, love, and compassion, as well as the goal of attaining individual liberation, hence the name of the vehicle. And that's the liberation from addiction and from suffering, which forms the basis of all Buddhist ethics and practice. Then session three, next Tuesday, a week from tonight, back here at Tibet House, will be on the universal vehicle ethics, exoteric. This session will focus on the mature exoteric universal attitudes, practices, and perspectives of great compassion, altruistic mind training, Spirit of Awakening and the Six Perfections of Generosity, Ethics, Tolerance, Vigilance, Meditation, Wisdom. And then the fourth session will be on the esoteric or tantric or vajra vehicle of Buddhism. Again, back at Jewel Heart. Week from Thursday, focusing on the advanced esoteric uh, universal perspectives and practices of cultivating the Buddha identity and pure perception that support and constitute tantric ethics and accelerated techniques for achieving Buddhahood. Okay, so with that, we'll dive into it. And um, my plan is to spend uh, probably a little more than half the time, we'll see how it goes, um, providing with some information. And then we can stop and have time for, uh, hopefully a good amount of time for questions and discussion. Okay, so uh, we just mentioned these three vehicles. Uh, the three vehicles also have a, a set of vows or ethics associated with each of them, which will be the main topic we'll be discussing tonight and throughout the four nights. And there's sort of a 500-year uh, historical manifestations of each of these. And I usually like to draw this on a blackboard or something so it sort of comes at you one piece at a time. 
but so you can understand what's going on here. At the bottom line up there where it says individual vehicle, 500 BCE, the idea here is that uh, Shakyamuni Buddha was in India, born approximately 500 BCE, and according to uh, practicing Buddhists of all three vehicles, Shakyamuni Buddha taught all three vehicles during his lifetime. He was alive for 81 years, taught for 45 years, so an enormous amount of teaching. And, but he only taught the individual vehicle in a way that was, you know, that was the most public version. It was the most exoteric version, and that's the version that was well recorded and well documented from the get-go um, and publicly available. Now, teachings at that time were actually not written down, and sometimes people think that's maybe a problem. It's actually a benefit. Um, oral culture is actually much better at preserving texts than written culture. You can imagine that when you write a text, it's possible for somebody else to copy that text, maybe make a typo or a scribo, and pages can get lost and so forth. People can insert paragraphs. It's very easy for a text that's been floating around a country for a while in a written form to get messed up. Whereas, interestingly, counterintuitively, an oral text, if the Buddha spoke for an hour, his audience members were extremely talented and gifted at memorization, as, as many people are to this day in these Buddhist traditions. So you'd have an audience of several hundred people who would memorize word for word what he would say, and then they would recite it to each other. It would be like memorizing a Shakespeare play. And you know if you recite a Shakespeare play to other Shakespearean actors, if you get one word wrong, everybody jumps on you because they know how that soliloquy from Hamlet goes, right? So actually, the oral texts, because they were memorized by so many people, were actually very, very solidly uh, maintained, durable texts. That's an important point, I think. So you had these, t these oral texts that were uh, circulated. At the time the, the Buddha passes away, um, a large number of arhats or saints gather and, into a council, and they recite the different texts that they've heard. And that's why the Buddhist sutras or discourses always start with the phrase, Thus have I heard at one time the Buddha was at such and such a place, and he said the following. So a sutra or a discourse, um, a sutra is a Sanskrit word, sutta in Pali, is simply a word meaning discourse, and it can be something as, as you know, middle length like this, the Vimalakirti Sutra. They can be very short, several paragraphs. They can be very long, the size of a gigantic volume. But the entire uh, initial canon that represents this kind of uh, individual vehicle Buddhism is not that many sutras and other discourses. It's a large, a large amount, but it certainly does not look like 45 years worth of teaching. So it does beg the question of what else might he have taught that didn't happen to get recorded into that particular canon? Well, the answer is, around 500 years after his passing, a whole bunch of other sutras come to light. And these are what are called the universal vehicle sutras. And we'll be discussing at great length in these three nights, four nights, the difference between these vehicles. But think of the, the vehicles are like paths, or spiritual paths. They do use the term path in Buddhism, but they also prefer oftentimes the term vehicle. The idea being that a set of spiritual teachings uh, are sort of a systematic package that if you practice them and use them, function as a vehicle to sort of take you from here to where you want to go. So about 500 years roughly after the Buddha's passing, an enormous uh, trove of text starts to emerge. These are called the universal vehicle teachings. And you'll notice there's a dotted line I've put between the universal vehicle on that second layer and the individual vehicle. The idea being that these are not, this is not a complete break from the tradition. These universal vehicle teachings aren't something totally new and different and never, you know, no continuity. In fact, they're very much continuous with the individual vehicle teachings, but they sort of extend them and, and go deeper. And what they in particular extend is the notion, the idea of emptiness or selflessness that we'll be discussing a lot. They go deeper into that show the profound ramifications of that. And they also expand ethics quite a bit um, into uh, what's called great compassion. So a notion of love and compassion is certainly there in the individual vehicle, but it gets really deepened and, and strengthened in the universal vehicle. And then about 500 years later, again, another uh, sort of set of teachings and practices comes to light, and that's the esoteric vehicle, roughly 500 CE, uh, the esoteric or tantric vehicle. And it's important to understand that the esoteric or tantric vehicle or Vajra vehicle is actually a sub-vehicle of the universal vehicle. So there's, in one way of looking at it, there's really two vehicles. There's the individual vehicle and the universal vehicle. That's it. But the universal vehicle subdivides into an exoteric, which appeared first, and then an esoteric version that appears 500 years later. As of the time that we hit 500 CE, Buddhism is really taking off and flourishing in India and major um, monastic institutions and universities are really beginning to flourish 
And all three of these types of Buddhism are taught often in a very integrated way. It's not so much that Buddhists are off in their different camps. They're, they're much more uh, still, there's sometimes there's some factionalism, but in a, to a large extent in universities like Nalanda and so forth, there's, uh, practicing Buddhists are writing about, studying, and practicing um, oftentimes all three vehicles. It's significant that that third vehicle comes to light at that time period, because at that time period, shortly thereafter, by about the year 700, uh, Buddhism has been going to East Asia for about 700 years, so from about zero to 700. But by that time, Buddhism is so well established in China and Korea and Japan that they've got their own traditions going, their own enlightened masters, their own sutras that they've chosen that they like to form schools around. So around that time, East Asia, interestingly, decides they're not that interested in going back to India and, and, and finding out what's, what's the update. So, and this is right around the time when Tantric Buddhism is really beginning to take off in India. In fact, the flourishing of Tantric Buddhism happens from about 500 or 700 until about 1200, when the institutions are all destroyed by invading Turks. All of these universities, these great, incredible uh, first universities in the world, um, are completely destroyed. So the institutional infrastructure for Buddhism is wiped out in around 1200. But between around uh, 600 and 1200 in that period, when all of this is being taught, that's precisely when Central Asia is importing Buddhism. So Tibet, uh, uh, particularly Tibet, but Mongolia and other Central Asian countries. And that's one of the reasons why Tibetan Buddhism is so unique and special because it's the, really the only form of Buddhism on the planet geographically that preserves all three of these vehicles of Buddhism. So when we look at the kinds of ethics associated with all three of these vehicles, you really have to look to Tibetan Buddhism since it was destroyed then in India. Tibetan Buddhism is really the only form of Buddhism historically that preserves everything. So I have the dotted lines between them going this way to show that there's sort of continuity between the vehicles. And of course, there's dotted lines going that way showing that although the universal vehicle appears, looks like it appears in zero CE, it actually sort of existed in an underground kind of way all the way back to the time of the Buddha, or so universalist Buddhists say. Um, historians, Western historians sometimes dispute that. Uh, I myself uh, can see the arguments both ways, but I do have to say that when you look at the universal vehicle teachings that appear at this time, they are so fully developed, like the Vimalakirti Sutra is an excellent example. They're so fully developed and profoundly developed that when, they, when you really get into understanding them and seeing how they resonate with the uh, individual vehicle teachings, it seems basically incomprehensible that a, uh, a group of brilliant scholars suddenly made them up uh, at that time, all with enormous number of sutras, uh, giving exegesis on an enormous number of very profound topics, philosophical topics having to do with ontology and epistemology, states of consciousness, meditative texts, um, ethical texts, and so forth. It would be a, a pretty amazing human feat if, if one generation of scholar practitioners just suddenly invented the Mahayana and there it was. So at a minimum, it's certainly arguable that something like Mahayana, proto-Mahayana, sometimes scholars call, uh, call it, would have existed from the beginning. And I see no reason no plausible, compelling reason not to take the tradition at its word that Mahayana Buddhism or universal vehicle Buddhism existed and was taught since the time of the Buddha and was taught by the Buddha as did esoteric Buddhism. That's my take on it. The other way you can look at this is, as, as I say in the next bullet point, also is a series of concentric circles. I didn't get to draw it, but again, I would normally draw this on a blackboard. You could imagine individual vehicle Buddhism being like a circle like this with an eye in it. And Universal vehicle Buddhism is something like a concentric circle. That it, it, so it includes that at its core, but then it goes beyond it. And then esoteric Buddhism is a larger circle that includes that. So in terms of the practices, the doctrines, the ethics, and so forth, they each have the other one at their core. So then for each of these vehicles or paths, uh, there are vows. And the, there's different terms that, come to, that are sort of related to what we're talking about, ethics. There's the term vows or samvara in Sanskrit, commitments, samaya, ethics, shila, which is the main term we'll be looking at, and then discipline, vinaya. And sometimes these terms are used uh, by people a little bit loosely, not by Buddhists or by Buddhist scholars, but by Buddh uh, practicing Buddhists in the West who don't, aren't familiar with these terms. So it'll be important for us to distinguish between these terms. So for example, the vinaya is the code of discipline that monks follow, monks and nuns follow. And a lot of the vows that monks and nuns take have to do with ethics. Some of them are, have to do with ethics, not killing and so forth. 
but a lot of their vows have to do with something that looks more like uh, etiquette, how, how you wear your robes, what you do and don't wear, things to do with social comportment and so forth, which don't necessarily have an ethical charge to them. They have more to do with disciplining your behavior in order to focus your mind in a certain way. So tangentially related to ethics, but not specifically ethics per se. And commitments and vows, again, are um, commitments and vows are promises, duties that a practitioner at a different levels can take on. They aren't necessarily, they have ethical, an ethical charge to them insofar as once one's taken a vow to do something or not do something, then there are sort of ethical consequences if you break that vow. But within Buddhist practice, um, it's expected as a very forgiving sort of tradition. There's an expectation that the reason you take the vow is not with the idea that you're never going to break it. You take it with the intention to try not to break it, but you're doing a vow, you're taking on a vow that is a challenge. And it's expected that you might break it. And so if you do break a given vow, depending on what vow it is and how severe the situation was, there's all sorts of ways for repairing that vow, for sort of confessing, feeling regret for that, and so forth, and retaking that vow. That's actually an expected part of the practice. So that's another layer of uh, overall sort of ethics we'll be talking about. The, but the main topic of ethics really has to do with the kinds of actions that have to do with engaging with other beings that you either should or shouldn't do because they have to do with the quality of that interaction. They either increase suffering or they decrease suffering and increase happiness and uh, camaraderie and so forth. So we'll be talking a lot about that kind of ethics, uh, Sheila, and then a little bit about vows and commitments that are related to that as we go on. So the three vows then that have to do with each of these, there's a sets of vows that have to do with each of these three vehicles. Um, they come to be a universal lens or trope. There's a particular book written by Saki Pandita, who was a great uh, Tibetan scholar uh, early on in the second dissemination of Buddhism. And he wrote this book called, a clear, which has been translated as a clear differentiation of the three codes, or the Dom Sum Rabye, the Dom Sum in Tibetan. This is his uh, exegesis of the nature of these three vows. And the person who introduces and translates that book, Jared Roten, says this uh, quote here, two underlying premises of Sapan's at Sakyapandita's work are that every Buddhist practice can be associated with one of three distinct systems of discipline, the Pratimoksha of the Shravaka school, so that's the, individual, the vow of individual liberation of the individual school, the Bodhisattva vow of the Mahayana or universal school, and the Vidyadhara vow of the Vajrayana or esoteric lineages. And further, that these three are not completely distinct in nature, but become in fact of a single nature through transformation during a Vajrayana initiation. So in later Indian Buddhism, where uh, Tantra is very much taught in practice, and then in Tibetan Buddhism, where it's very much taught in practice and integrated and becomes sort of the norm, it becomes part of what it means to be a Buddhist, it's expected um, that on some level, um, a practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism will probably be taking on all three of those, although often the, the Vajrayana esoteric is considered a very advanced practice. It's something that becomes part of the currency of conversation, part of the paradigm, the worldview, that your average Tibetan looks at the world through, and he or she, almost any lay Tibetan, would receive many initiations from different lamas traveling through town. That doesn't necessarily mean they fully understand what they're doing or receiving, or they're really fully practicing it, but they're receiving it as a blessing. This is true to this day. You'll have this, you ask uh, a lay Tibetan, and they'll oftentimes tell you, yeah, I'm, I'm here for a blessing. I'm not the greatest practitioner. I don't exactly know what the lama's talking about, but I'm here to a blessing, and I'll maybe say the mantras and do a few visualizations. And they actually usually have, because it permeates the culture so deeply and has for over a thousand years, even your uneducated, you know, lay Tibetan probably has a, a pretty good idea of what that practice entails, even if they don't, couldn't fully explain it or, or don't fully practice it themselves. Then more educated Tibetans and certainly monks and nuns um, who would be very well trained and sometimes spend many decades uh, studying exoteric before then being initiated into and studying esoteric Buddhism they then would, uh, could explain fully what it is they're practicing and why, and how, this, how these more difficult vows that take place um, at the esoteric level, what they mean and why it is that, as Sapan saying, they encompass. So by, in other words, by keeping the, in a sense you keep all of these vows, or the, you, you follow the ethics of all three vehicles in this kind of a tradition, but there is an understanding that the way the ethics work actually is that if you keep the tantric vows, 
properly, you're automatically sort of keeping your bodhisattva vows, and you're automatically, therefore, keeping your individual vows. So we'll be, some of this is familiar territory to some of you, I'm sure. Some of it might be new language to you. So I'll be explaining uh, in some detail what each of these three things means. So this is just a quick overview of what we'll be talking about. So I think um, I'll come back to this because what we're going to see is that the, the key, as again, probably many of you know, um, there are several ways that you can summarize Buddhist theory and practice. One is certainly the Four Noble Truths that's common to all Buddhist practices. That is the, the insight the Buddha had into the nature of that, that it's sometimes translated as all life is suffering. That's sort of a mistranslation or misunderstanding because that would be pretty pessimistic. What he said more clearly was uh, afflicted life or addicted life is suffering. So, and as we'll see, that comes to mean um, life based on the misunderstanding of the nature of the self. And the fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the self is that the self is some sort of an ego that somehow is separate from you and from everything else. So the notion that um, I exist as some sort of an independent autonomous person that's somehow disconnected from you all, we may have some interrelationship and so forth, but on some fundamental level, I'm an individual separate person. That is considered a form of misknowledge or ignorance or delusion. I like the translation misknowledge best because it connotes the idea that you know something to be true, I know I exist, but you actually are sorely mistaken. And the first noble truth is that on that basis of misknowledge, on that fundamental uh, addiction or affliction, on the basis of that, if you're, if you're living your life on that basis, suffering will automatically occur. You can try to you know, have a happy life, maybe some good things will happen to you, but your basic uh, fundamental existential reality will be one of suffering because it's, a, it's, based, it's, number one, not based on reality, which is what Buddhist philosophy will try to argue. And because it's not based on reality, you're living a lie, and you're trying to patch things up and make the ego better and happier and stronger, and you're f waging a losing battle because this, the nature of the self and the nature of relationships isn't that way. So afflicted or addicted life is suffering, particularly if it's based on this false concept. But the good news, again, on the, the next three truths are, number two, there's a cause for suffering. And that's a bit, that should strike us a bit strange if we haven't thought about it before, because we, normally we think, of course, there's a, you know, if a brick lands on my foot, the cause of the suffering is the brick, or maybe the neurons in my foot, or maybe it's that bad guy over there who threw the brick at my foot. So we certainly have a notion of causation, that suffering is caused, but we tend to think of it as sort of in the external ways. What he's talking about here is that on a more meta level or existential level, there's a cause of suffering that doesn't have to do just with that, because after all, some people can have things happen to them and it doesn't make them suffer. We all know that. Different people have different tolerances for physical pain, but also psychological pain, and that's mysterious, or it seems mysterious. If cause X automatically caught, made suffering Y happen, then you'd have a determination, you know, determinative system here. That's not the case. So there must be something deeper that's actually the cause of suffering that's not just this external thing or that guy. And according to the Buddha's analysis, um, if you dig deeply enough, what you find out there is, a, there is sort of a final root cause to suffering, and it is these three addictions we'll be talking about. Misknowledge, number one, which I just spoke of, and then desire and aversion or hatred that sort of spring from that fundamentalist knowledge. But, so that's his fundamental insight about the fact that there is a cause of suffering. The third noble truth then is that there is a cessation to suffering that, amazingly enough, he claims to have discovered it's actually possible to uproot and extinguish those addictions once and for all. And again, we don't want to mistakenly think this means extinguishing the self. There is, we'll spend a fair amount of time nuancing this and making it clear the self is not being extinguished here. The egoic self or the, or the falsely constructed self that where we think we're the separate thing, that is an illusion and that ends up being sort of seen through and dispensed with. But a relative, vibrant, um, infinitely possible self that is fluid and, and, um, and not stagnant, ascension beings, consciousness, that is something that does exist. There is a relative self that exists and it can be, uh, we all know we can lessen our degree of anger, we can lessen our desire. Maybe if we really work on it in meditation and through some philosophical training, we can lessen our mistaken understanding of self. The Buddha's claim and the Buddhist claim is that you can't, not only can you do that a little bit, like we in the West would sort of acknowledge, 
But you can do that to the nth degree. You can completely eradicate it. And that's sort of a, a, an outrageous claim, at least from the West's point of view. Um, but that's the claim, is that it can be thoroughly eradicated. So that's the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering. And then the fourth noble truth is the roadmap. It's the how-to, the path to the end of to, to ceasing the cause of suffering and therefore suffering. So we'll be talking about some, uh, all of these topics throughout the Four Nights because Buddhist ethics is related to these four topics. Um, there are other ways that we can summarize uh, Buddhism. Another uh, common way is to say that Buddhism is really can be summarized into two words, wisdom and compassion. All of Buddhist insight and teachings has to do with wisdom and compassion. That's more of a universal vehicle way of summarizing it. Um, sometimes it's said that uh, it's wisdom and ethics, and we'll see this in just a minute, Wisdom, ethics, and meditation. Those are the three things you practice as a Buddhist. There's another way of uh, summarizing the nature of reality, which are these four insignia, which we'll look at in a minute. Because the reason I have that up here now is because, again, the fundamental thing we're going to be coming back to in all, all of these talks is this notion of insight, wisdom, into the nature of the self. Because that is what grounds Buddhist ethics. So Buddhist ethics is not grounded in some list of commandments that the Buddha gave, or you know, something like that. It's listed, it's, it's founded, Buddhist ethics is founded fundamentally on this insight. And it's founded on an insight. The other thing that's important to emphasize is that this insight is something that each individual, at the time when the Buddha was alive, he said this, and everybody since then has been told this, must come to this insight for themselves. It does you no good just to accept it because the Buddha said it, or your Zen master said it, or your Lama said it. It can maybe help that you know helps guide you and steer you in a certain direction to follow your spiritual guide's advice, but only to a certain point. Really, if you want to really progress beyond a certain point, you have to investigate and doubt everything. Uh, so much so that Nagarjuna, one of the great uh, philosophers who actually revealed the Mahayana teachings, he's one of the people who sort of brought these sutras into the fore. He's uh, famously quoted as saying that. Um, Emptiness or selflessness, which is this fundamental insight we're talking about, is something that's in a way very dangerous, and it's something that you have to understand properly. If you misunderstand it, it becomes sort of nihilistic. You can think no self exists. So it's a bit dangerous. Uh, but if, if, so if it's misunderstood, it's like he said, it's like a poorly grabbed snake. It's like grabbing a, a venomous snake. It'll, if you grab it in the middle of the body, it'll rip around and bite you. Right? So it's kind of dangerous. You have to grab it, you have to seize the understanding of emptiness just right. And if you do, then it actually can cure. The understanding of emptiness is said to be a cure to ex the extreme view of, an, of a separate self. But it's something you have to do yourself. And it's, it's also said, another famous quote from him is that the doctrine or the teaching of emptiness, which is sort of a negative teaching, it's not a declaration that this is the case. It's really a deconstructive kind of methodology, really, that says, if you think the self exists in the way you think it does, then let's examine that and use these kind of analytical tools to look at whether that is plausible. So the doctrine of emptiness is a set of tools that allows you to deconstruct the self. And it's actually said to be the cure for all dogmatic views. It actually frees you up from being able to hold on to any view dogmatically. And the guardian says, since emptiness is the, considered the cure to all dogmatic views, therefore anybody who considers emptiness to be their view is considered incurable. So you can't seize on to emptiness as sort of being your view and you put it on your sleeve and I'm a Buddhist and I, I proclaim emptiness. It actually is more like a medicine or a therapy. So Buddhism we can look at, the Buddhist path, we can look at very much as being sort of a, a, a therapeutic practice and medicine and emptiness being something like a medicine that cures us of the disease of reifying things. So we'll be coming back to these topics um, a fair amount as we move on. But having to give you that backdrop, um, we're not going to necessarily start right now with selflessness. It's sort of a difficult, those are deep waters to start in. We'll back up a little bit and look at some basic ethics and see eventually how they're grounded in this idea of, of selflessness. I will read one quote now. I think this would be a good time to read it uh, from Nagarjuna. Because the Buddha teaches, again, he, he taught these Pali Sutras and then the Mahayana Sutras. There's an enormous number of discourses in which he puts forward different views on the self, on emptiness, on the path forward, on the kinds of ethics you might want to follow. And it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of teaching, which makes sense. He's actually being very attentive in each teaching he gives to the individual or individual group of people 
and giving a teaching to that group that's appropriate to their level of understanding and to their level of spiritual development. So when this gets orally recorded and eventually written down, you end up with an enormous number of sutras or discourses that seem to say different things. And they almost seem to sometimes contradict each other. That is then, the, interestingly, the role of uh, Buddhist philosophy and practice, actually, is, is precisely you're putting that we are put in the hot seat to try to adjudicate this and figure out why did you say this here and say that over there? And they seem to contradict each other. The, the, sci the art and science of reconciling such statements is, you know, in the West, it's called the art and science of hermeneutics, taking different scriptural, scriptural statements and reconciling them and showing that, well, yes, he said this in this case because he was talking to that audience, and this in this case for that reason because he was talking to that audience, and we can hierarchically arrange these teachings to say that a person of a certain level of understanding or spiritual development should logically hear this. And it's a more mature thing to say this, and so on. And for the most part, most people agree on these kinds of stacking, and sometimes they debate on, well, no, wait a minute, this is actually higher than that. That's where the debates sometimes get interesting. So given that, um, it would be useful. This is a text by Nagarjuna we were discussing in the Force for Good uh, a few Wednesdays ago, the Jewel Rosary. And there's one famous verse towards the end of this, a set of verses. 394, 5, and 6. So this is Nagarjuna, 2,000 years ago. He says, just as a grammarian first has students read a model of the alphabet, so just so Buddha taught trainees the doctrines that they could bear. So, you know, when you're in grade school, you're not learning all about how to diagram a sentence from kindergarten. You're learning your ABCs first. And then eventually you're learning about parts of speech, nouns and verbs, eventually conjugating, and eventually pretty complex grammar. The Buddha teaches in a similar way. So to some, the Buddha taught doctrines to turn them away from ill deeds. And we'll be looking at some of these kinds of ethical teachings. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. That's it. That's basic ethics, and he didn't say anything else. Didn't talk about selflessness, didn't talk about universal compassion. He just said, get your house in order with respect to not abusing other people, basically. And if you can do the opposite, if you can actually help people, save lives, tell the truth, and so forth, so much the better. So another one of the famous sort of axioms that summarizes the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha himself said this when asked once, you know, can, how can you, can you summarize your entire teaching in one sentence? He said, sure. Don't harm others. Try to help others. Tame your mind. That's the teaching of the Buddha. So to some he taught doctrines to turn away from ill deeds. To some for the sake of achieving, uh, to some he taught for the sake of achieving merit. As merit something like a kind of a spiritual power. It's a bit of a difficult topic, but we'll try to discuss it, what exactly merit is. But it's kind of a positive spiritual energy you build up. To some uh, doctrines based on duality. There's a, there's a, there's a self here and a self there. You need, to, you need to treat other selves. He didn't, in other words, try to, break down the duality. He taught as if duality was reality. You're going to be born here, you're going to die, you're going to be born over there in the future, that's going to be a different self. You have other people you have to interact with. In all sorts of social and cosmological ways, he spoke as if dualities were real. But then on the next level up, to some he taught doctrines based on non-duality. This is an even more complex topic. And then finally, to some, he taught what is profound and frightening to the fearful having an essence of emptiness and compassion, the means of achieving unsurpassed enlightenment. So the highest level of ethics actually combines emptiness and compassion. Those two things I mentioned were the essence of Buddhism. And this particular phrase uh, in Tibetan is Toni Ningje Ningbo Chen, or in Sanskrit, Shunyata Karno Garbam. It's a beautiful phrase. Uh, shunyata Karno Garbam, Shunyata is emptiness, Karna is compassion. And garbam can mean, can be translated different ways. It can mean essence, it can mean womb, it can mean seed. Um, you know the Tathagata Garbha, some of you are familiar with the Tathagata Garbha, that's the, the Buddha nature or the essence of the Buddha or something like that. So shunyata karana garbam means something like emptiness, which has an essence of compassion, or emptiness, which is the seed of compassion. There's different ways of translating it. But this idea is that emptiness and compassion are sort of, are intimately interrelated. You could almost say emptiness gives birth to compassion. Or emptiness is the womb of compassion, right? So this is the, like, kind of the most profound level where the inside of the, philosoph the deepest philosophical insight and the, and the most uh, deepest kind of uh, ethics come together, non-dually. 
So that's a, a list Nagarjuna is giving here of kind of the levels of ethics that we'll be uh, also looking at. So let me bring up this document. So I want to just backtrack a little bit then. And I think it'll be helpful to uh, talk a little bit about where some of these categories come from. A quick, li quick lesson in history. And where we're, where we're headed towards is um, this graphic here will be coming to this. And many of you who, who've been practicing or studying Buddhism for any length of time will be familiar with this. But it's going to be very important to see how we get to this. And you'll see why in a few minutes. Where we're getting to is this notion that the, the fourth noble truth, which is the truth of the path I mentioned, you know, how, do you, how do you do all this? The fourth noble truth is oftentimes uh, cited as being broken down into, well, it's the eightfold, right? It's the eightfold path. And what is the eightfold path? Eight branches of the noble path are, it's, you, you usually see this translated as right, right view, right consideration, intention, right speech. The words here in, in Sanskrit, samyaka, doesn't just mean right, like right, wrong. It's not a sort of moralistic right, wrong. Samyaka is difficult to translate one way for each of these, but it means something more like authentic or realistic. Um, so right view is not really right view. It's not like you have to learn to accept the Buddha's view, and that's just the way. It's realistic view. If you really analyze the possible ways in which reality might be put together, there's one that, comes, that, that ends up uh, philosophically making sense, being plausible, being coherent. Other views end up, under analysis, breaking down and, and falling apart as incoherent. So there's sort of a realistic view that you come to. And likewise, a realistic consideration or intention, having realistic in the sense of um, your relationship, your intention uh, to, with others. Realistic or authentic speech, again, you could say authentic here. Action and livelihood are the middle three, and then the last three are effort, mindfulness or recollection, and concentration, the word there being samadhi sometimes translated as meditation. And these are the eight things that one does. They're not necessarily uh, practiced in this order. They're all, they all mutually reinforce each other. Those, these are eight things that you do. And what you can see then is that these are grouped according to these, this middle column, the three higher trainings of wisdom, ethics, and concentration or meditation. So it kind of makes sense. Realistic view and consideration or intention are connected to wisdom. Speech, action, and livelihood have to do with ethics. And effort, mindfulness, and concentration all have to do with concentration and meditation. And then the final column here is really the, the loosest. It's not really a good grouping, but a traditional Buddhists will say that, oh, yes, the, the Vinaya teachings are all about ethics. The sutras are really talking about concentration. And, therefore, and the Abhidharma, which is sort of a uh, meta-canonical or para-canonical thing, scholars that wrote things down, they synthesized the Buddhist teachings into these other texts that they wrote called the Abhidharma. That's, that's where you get wisdom. That breaks down almost immediately as soon as you start to think of it because the sutras, which means the discourses, weren't just talking about the meditation. In fact, when the Buddha was talking about philosophy or wisdom, he did them in discourses. It wasn't just later scholars who figured this out. So plenty of sutras talk about wisdom and plenty of sutras, many sutras, enormous number of sutras, even in the Pali Canon, talk about ethics. So this is sort of, this last column is kind of an artificial breakdown, but for various reasons, uh, Buddhist traditions like to line things up like this. So I would, I would take that last column with a grain of salt. Likewise, Vinaya does not mean ethics. We talked about that earlier in, in the beginning. Vinaya really has to do more with the discipline that monks and nuns take on. It can include ethics, but it's certainly not the catch-all word for ethics. So you can kind of bracket that last column. But this middle column is what's really most important. And what we're going to see in a minute is why, in a way, although we're all taught usually when, you're, when you sort of study Buddhism 101, that the Eightfold Path is the big thing that you need to do. In a way, it is, but actually more important is this middle three. And we'll see now why that is. So let's back up just historically. And what I'm going to be covering here is from a really wonderful book that we actually use in the class teaching a class now in Buddhist ethics up at Columbia. And there's a, one book we use, which I highly recommend, called The Nature of Buddhist Ethics by Damien Kion. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to get because I think it's print on demand, so you're not going to find it at Barnes & Noble. But you can go onto Amazon and order it. And it might take a few extra days to get there. It's a pretty amazing um, survey of, of many, many topics in Buddhist ethics really covering uh, the Pali individual vehicle kinds of ethics, and then a lot of really interesting things about Mahayana ethics. 
If you've been studying or practicing Buddhism for 20 years already, I guarantee you you'll find all sorts of really dense and good material in here that you've never seen before. If you've never studied anything before, it's a pretty good introduction. It'll probably give you more than you want. But it's, it's pretty good about uh, giving you a lot of the canonical basis in the Pali Canon for individual and the Sanskrit Canon for Mahayana ethics. Um, it doesn't really give you the feeling or the flavor. What does it feel like? Hopefully we'll do some of that in the talks we're doing here. You'll get that more from contemporary writers like the Pema Trojans and the Dalai Lamas and so forth. It's not that kind of a book. This is much more of a scholarly book, but it's a lot of really good information. Also, he doesn't go into tantric ethics, doesn't even try. So here's what we're going to look at now then. is just the, in terms of individual vehicle or, or what was recorded in Pali, in the Pali language, canonical sources for Buddhist ethics. So this is coming directly from this book. Um, in the Pali Canon, the long discourses of the Diga Nikaya has 34 discourses in three divisions. You can buy this book from Wisdom Publications, the, long, the, the sutras, the discourses that the Buddha gave. For some reason, they decided to collect them and instead of by theme, like we would probably do. They collected them by length. So there's a collection of long discourses, middle discourses, and short discourses, and then another collection of assorted discourses, miscellaneous, and so forth. But again, not that many. If you had all the Pali Sutras on your bookshelf, it would be like this many. The books would you know, line up, it would be that thick. So the long discourses, you can buy it, right? Some of you probably have it, a green book about that thick. The first section of that has 34 discourses in three divisions. Now, you don't have to remember all this, but this is just so you see where we're coming from. The first division is known as the Collection on Ethical Practices, or the Sila Kunda Vaga. So Sila is that word, ethics. And it is comprised of the first 13 discourses. So the first 13 sutras are about ethics, specifically. The first sutta, the discourse on Brahma's net, or the Brahmajala Sutta, has a long section on ethics, which itself is then divided into three tracts or vagas, describing ethics for which the Buddha or an ideal wanderer or shramana may be praised. And that's important in the sense that the, what the Buddha is saying in this case is he's saying, here are the kinds of things that a Buddha does, ethically speaking, and not just a Buddha, because he's, you know, other shramanas or wanderers or wandering ascetics, yogis are a very spiritually high level. This is how, this is what they would do. This is kind of a mark. If you, if you see a Buddha, you would praise him for the fact that he doesn't kill and for the fact that he doesn't tell lies and so forth. So he gives a list of such things. So notice he's not in this particular sutra saying, here's a bunch of commandments I'm going to tell you all to do. He's also, also noticed, importantly, that he's not saying, because one um, fallacy that Kion takes on in this book very directly head on is the false notion that ethics is something on the Buddhist path that you kind of do in the beginning as a beginner. Once you get to a certain advanced level, you can kind of throw out ethics because now your wisdom is so high that you sort of are above and you're beyond ethics, you transcend ethics. And there are sutras that seem to say, that seem to suggest that might be the case, but they're misunderstood. He does a very good job of arguing why they're misunderstood. And it's not just him, a Western scholar doing this. This was a common problem throughout Indian exegesis and Tibetan exegesis. So for example, Tsongkhapa in the 1400s who helped found the Galukpa tradition writes an enormous amount about this topic, about the topic that ethics is not just something you do at a preliminary level and then you throw it away like you throw away the raft when you get to the other side of the river. Sometimes that's cited as an example. Actually, ethics is something you t it takes you all the way up to Buddhahood and it actually constitutes Buddhahood. So Buddhahood is actually so the enlightened state is actually con constituted by two things, wisdom and ethics. A Buddha is an embodiment of wisdom and ethics. So ethics is constituent of the entire path. It's not just something that's preliminary. That's important. And that's part of why he says that here. You would praise a Buddha. That's why this is significant, too. You would praise a Buddha for the fact that these are the things he does or doesn't do. OK, so then um, the short track then has uh, 20, a list of 26 abstentions, things he abstains from. And when you look at them, you'll, you, we notice that the first seven are unethical acts of body and speech. And I'll just give you an idea of what we're talking about here. So for example, and it's a little bit misleading because the short track actually has the longest list. And the med uh, what's called the medium track, you see it says there are 10 abstentions. And these are essentially further precision, plugging loopholes, et cetera. And then the short track, uh, I'm sorry, that should say the long track. Change that right now. 
be long, has seven. So why is it uh, short, medium, and long? Because the, sh the, the short track, although it has 60, 20, a list of 26 things, it doesn't elaborate about, about them at length. Whereas when they get into the medium track, a lot more discussion occurs, including a discussion of the other 26. And then likewise, the long track really goes into even more details. So the short track is 26, just for example. You'll see it says the first seven are universal, unethical acts of body and speech. Some of you will recognize these seven. These are things he abstains from. A Buddha or anybody like a Buddha would abstain from taking life, taking what's not been given, unchastity or sexual misconduct, lying, slanderous speech, harsh speech, and frivolous talk or idle gossip. That, those seven will sound familiar to some of you. Then the next uh, uh, numbers 8 through 12, the next five have to do with lifestyle, causing th some, some strange things, causing injury to seeds or plants. But this has to do with you know, destroying the basis of food. Um, eating more than once after midday, something that monks, of course, do. Monks and nuns vow not to eat after midday, and so forth. Uh, you know, being distracted by meaningless entertainment, wearing uh, ornaments and perfumes, and so forth. And then some things to do with offerings not to accept. He doesn't accept money. He doesn't deal with money. And then in the last set, um, he doesn't invo involve in cheating and bribery and so forth. So there's this list of 26 things. Now, why is this significant? Because the short tract, which contains this list of 26, ends up being foundational for all Buddhist ethics. OK? So just, we'll just keep that in mind from now. Now, in terms of actual ethical lists, does anybody, do any Buddhist traditions take that list of 26 and say, well, great, the Buddha said, that's what you'd praise him for, so I guess we should take this list of 26 as being our ethical you know, to-do list. Not quite. What happens shortly uh, thereafter, even at the time of the Buddha, is they extract from that and from various other discourses even shorter lists that are distilled from that, however. So for example, some of you will be familiar with some of these. There's the five precepts, the Panchashila, and these are canonical, directly derived from the above. And we're going to discuss each of these in just a second. And then there's uh, the eight precepts, the 10 precepts, the 10 paths of wholesome action. And then finally, interestingly, those are all directly canonical. And finally, the vows of individual liberation, or the Pratimoksha vows, the 227 vows that monks and nuns taste, are actually, in some sense, paracanonical. They're, and this is what the Divinia does discuss. The Divinia is actually the series of rules of, for monks and nuns. So if we look at these, for, then uh, again, some of you will be familiar with these. Uh, so, for example, the five precepts, these are things that, uh, these end up being things that then, this is core Buddhist ethics right here. Anybody who declares themselves to be a Buddhist practitioner does not do these five things. In fact, one of the ways, one of the things that defines one as a Buddhist is, of course, not just subscribing to some uh, dogma. Really, what defines one as a Buddhist is simply the decision. Initially, the Buddha, when he was alive, taking on followers, he just said, ehi bhikkhu. Come here. Come here, uh, monk or mendicant. And just come here. That, that meant you were a follower of the Buddha. That was it. You didn't sign on any, you know, sign a contract or anything. Over time, what happened was ethical dilemmas or problems would occur. And he would convene people and say, well, see, when we did this or that, it caused other people to suffer. It caused dissension either in our own sangha or with the outside world. Wouldn't it make sense to have a rule, make, aside we're going to have an obligation not to do that because it caused so much trouble? So they started collecting rules like that based on experience, not based on he said something. And that's really where the Vinaya actually originally came from, was, was sort of a case, it's like case law, case studies occurred. So for monks and nuns, for ethics, it would likewise develop, you know, obviously based on those 26 things we just saw, but what would, what developed out of that was a specific core list of five things that any Buddhist then, uh, eventually what happens is you're defined as a Buddhist if you choose to take refuge, or actually we're going to discuss that term uh, on Thursday when we're looking at the individual vehicle. What does it mean to go for refuge? I prefer to say go for refuge. But go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. To the Buddha, his teaching, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the spiritual community. Again, that's Thursday night. We'll talk more about that. That makes you a Buddhist. What does it mean to go to refuge in the uh, Dharma, to the Dharma? Among other things, it means you're going to, at minimum, follow these five basic ethical precepts, which are you don't take life, take what has not been given, engage in sexual misconduct, 
tell lies, or take intoxicants. Now that sounds pretty similar, right, to the, if you remember the, the list of 26, the first seven, very, very similar, uh, with a couple exceptions. But th those are the five basic do's and don'ts, sort of within uh, Buddhist ethics. The eight precepts, then, are, are those same five with uh, substitution of sexual abstention, I mean, substitution of no sexual misconduct, you substitute that with no sex at all. And then you add to that no eating at the wrong time, which means afternoon, no engaging in dancing, singing, music, basically entertainment, iPad nowadays, it would include the iPad and Netflix and everything else. And uh, interestingly, using high seats or beds to sleeping on. And that has to do with really all eight of these have to, just particularly that one, and similar to not wearing perfume and makeup and earrings and so forth. It has to do with not boosting up your ego. I'm such a high important person, I'm going to sit on this high chair up here on this throne, I'm going to sleep on a high bed. Now the eight are things that lay people do, so the five are something lay Buddhist practitioners take on. Needless to say, monks and nuns take on way more than that, eventually 227. But a lay Buddhist takes on those five, and then on a special, for their whole life, but then on a special day, on a special holy day, or on a day when they want to sort of generate more spiritual power or merit, they can voluntarily, for a 24-hour period, take on these, these eight, which are the same five, so it's killing, no stealing, it's actually not taking what's not given. It's important how that's phrased. So no taking life, no taking what's not been given. Now no sex at all for this one day. Uh, no telling lies, no taking intoxicants, no eating afternoon, no engaging in entertainment, and no high beds. So those eight things, lay, lay people throughout Buddhist Asia and the Buddhist West, the Buddhist world throughout centuries now, will take on those eight when they want to have a special uh, a day. It's kind of like monk light or nun light for a day. And it's from sunrise to sunrise. So when the sun rises the next day, you give it up and you go back to the five. The, uh, the ten precepts, um, number three on the list, are almost the same. It, it just expands a little bit. It separates dancing and singing and from using garlands, perfumes, high seats and beds, and finally accepting gold or silver, basically dealing with money. It's about the same. The 10 is not, very, not a very popular or well-known list. The 5 and the 8 are very, very well-known and well-practiced. The fourth thing is then extremely well-known and, and well-documented and well-practiced, and this is probably any of you who have studied Tibetan Buddhism in particular, but any form of Buddhism will know this list of 10. These are the 10 paths of good action, and again, you'll recognize this list. Three of body, no taking life, no... Um, so that's killing. No taking what's not been given. Stealing, only a little bit nuanced. Uh, no sexual misconduct. And of course, they discuss at some length what that means, but it basically means abusive sexual behavior. Those are three actions having to do with uh, body, bodily actions. Four having to do with speech. Uh, lying, slanderous speech, harsh speech, and idle talk. Lying is obvious. Slanderous speech and harsh speech are different. Harsh speech is like really, you know, lambasting somebody angrily and just telling them what a jerk they are, putting them in their place really harshly. Slanderous speech can be very nice. It can be very sweet, but you're actually undermining the person's, you know, character. Or something. You're, you're saying something behind their back or you're sowing seeds of dissension. So it can sound very nice, but actually you're using your language in a very destructive way. And then idle speech is considered of the whole list of 10, the least weighty, it's the lightest. But it's considered idle speech, gossip, is kind of just wasting your human life. Your human life is precious in a way every minute, is, every second is precious. So to the extent that you spend some of your time just chatting away about nothing, you're kind of wasting your time. You could be spending that in some way more meaningfully. Interestingly, um, it is the lightest one, and I know it, it usually causes us, us Westerners, me included, some dis un un unease because sometimes we like to just hang out and shoot the breeze with the friends, and actually isn't that maybe helpful in our spiritual practice just to kick back sometimes and not take things so seriously every single possible second. And interestingly, Shantideva, among other people, in the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, does talk about that. He talks about, in, when he's talking in the context of mindfulness, of really always watching your mind and always being hypervigilant of what is your mind doing and thinking and how ethical are you being. There are times when that gets so tight that actually you need to just relax. 
and give it up and stop the monitoring consciousness for a little while. Give yourself a little bit of a break. So Shantideva, interestingly, does address that concern. And presumably at that point, you, but there you'd sort of be intentionally doing it. You wouldn't be idly gossiping just out of, out of mindlessness. You would actually be sort of intending to say, you know what, I'm going to give myself a half an hour break and just go to get to it with my friend and shoot the breeze, maybe watch a TV show, whatever. But the idea is that it's being done with some level of intention. And it's not just getting out of control and becoming a, a habit. That's where it becomes problematic. So that's the lightest one. Now, do those seven sound familiar? The seven I just listed, three of body and four of mind, they were the exact first seven of the list of 26, right? So those are directly derived from that Brahmajala Sutra of how you, what you praise a Buddha for. The last three then, the first three are mind, uh, body, the next four are speech, the final three then are mind, having to do, so negative acts of, of the mind. Um, so uh, put it in the positive way, non-covetousness, so not, having, not coveting things that connects with the klesha or the addiction of desire, non-malevolence or malice, not having hatred. And then the last thing is um, samyak dishti, same as in the Eightfold Noble Path, authentic or realistic view. So having that or not having an unrealistic view. And this has to do with, um, this indirectly points to the third of the kleshas or the third of the addictions which is the, the root one, which is misknowledge. So if all suffering comes from misknowledge, primarily, and then secondarily from desire and hatred, those are all mental addictions, right? These three vows, these three non, whoops, these three non-virtues here of mind directly relate to that. What's interesting, but they were slightly reworded, not, not being covetous as opposed to not having desire or attachment, not having malice as opposed to hatred or anger, and then interesting, instead of saying not having this knowledge, it says having realistic views. And that specifically is explained in commentaries as meaning either you know, a deep level, having a realistic view of emptiness or, the, or selflessness, and on sort of a more mundane level, it means at least adopting a view to the extent you can understand it, a view of, of karma, of cause and effect, that actions you do with body, speech, and mind have effects. They don't just, it's almost like a law of, I forget which law it is in thermodynamics of conservation of energy or motion. It's like that karma is a law kind of like that. Karma is actually a big topic that in the courses at Columbia we always spend many, many, many days unpacking what karma does and doesn't mean because it's usually something that's very misunderstood uh, by people who studied Buddhism a little and by people who studied it quite a lot. So if we want to in these four nights talk about karma, we can certainly do so. We probably will need to do so. But karma in brief means ethical action or ethical cause and effect. It doesn't have anything to do with retribution. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with something you judge. It's something almost more automatic. Sometimes I give the example of um, I'll take an eraser and drop it on the floor. I'll pick the eraser up and put it back up on a table. When you pick up the eraser and put it up back on the table, you've just added something to that eraser. And what have you added to the eraser? Anybody know? Think physics in terms of physics, think of high school physics. There's something sort of mysteriously in that eraser that didn't, wasn't there a minute ago. You pick it up off the floor and you put it up here on the table. Energy. Yes, what kind of energy? Potential, Potential energy, right? And we don't think of that as being some sort of occult phenomena you have to prove or something. It, it's just, well, because it's you know, further from the center of the Earth, we, actually we don't know what gravity is, right? Certainly in Newtonian physics, we don't have any idea. Einstein came up with some pretty amazing theories, and quantum physics you know, goes further with it, but we, st we don't really even know what gravity is, actually. We can discuss it and describe it and make predictions and talk about a bending space and all sorts, but we don't know what it is. We don't even know what matter is, for that matter. But So in a way, it is kind of this occult thing as well, but just like we put the eraser up there and we say now there's, there's some sort of energy there, that's, karma is something like that. It's not, it doesn't require some outside force, doesn't require some judge, jury, executioner. It's not a cosmic bank account. It's something that's built into the action itself, just like the potential energy is built into this. Just like when you're in outer space and you have a 10 pound, you have a 150 pound astronaut push with this amount of force at his, you know, two ton spaceship, we can predict that the astronaut will go this way and the spaceship will go that way at a particular velocity based on the mass and the, right? It's just part of physics. And karma is something like that. It's like an equal and opposite action and reaction, 
but on an ethical level, on, on actually on a level having to do with the calculus of suffering and happiness, and the sta basically the state, the gestalt state of your mind, in a sense. In brief, okay. So karma is something like that. So right views or authentic views on a deep level means the view of selflessness or emptiness, and on a more, a little bit more mundane level, it means at least adopting the view of the of of karma. So that, those, are, those 10 uh, virtues or non-virtues, they can be spelled out positively or negatively, what you do or don't do. This is actually really kind of ethics 101 in terms of any practicing Buddhist nowadays. You, many of you probably already know this list, and if, if not, you, now you know it. And if you go to any Dharma center, uh, whether it's Zen or Pali or Tibetan, they should know this list, because this is kind of the day-to-day -day life of a Buddhist. This is what you are thinking about doing and not doing. So we just did that, discussed the details of one, two, and four. So now, in terms of the three higher trainings and the Eightfold Path, we saw the three higher trainings as the higher training in um, wisdom, ethics, and meditation, right? In that chart I had up a minute ago. Let's talk about that. So the Eightfold Path itself, which again, probably most of us think that's just, everyone knows that's Buddhism 101. It's actually less Buddhism 101 than you might think. And this is kind of what's interesting that Kion goes into. So the Eightfold Path is actually first mentioned in suttas six and eight out of those initial discourses. It's not in all of them. And this is a quote now from Kyon. In none of the sutras of the collection is there a division of the Eightfold Path in accordance with the three categories of morality, ethics, meditation, and insight found elsewhere. So you do find it elsewhere, but in these sutras where this first comes up, where the Eightfold Path comes up, the Buddha is not saying, oh, and by the way, these eight fit into these three. He's not saying that. In fact, somewhat the opposite. Various twofold, and so I'm on this line here now, various twofold and threefold schemas occur in different, different, did I spell that right now? Different sutras as follows. Sometimes it's a twofold division and sometimes it's a threefold division. So sometimes the Buddha talks about, well, everything basically collapses into conduct and knowledge. And notice the word here is charana and knowledge, vidya. Vidya in Pali or vidya in Sanskrit. That's sutra number three. So those are slightly different terms. Charana, conduct and knowledge. In another sutra, number four, he says, well, everything really reduces down to ethics and wisdom. That's more familiar, shila and prajna. Those are twofold classifications. In some sutras, he talks about a threefold classification. In sutra number three, and that isn't a typo, in sutra number three, he does both. So in sutra three, he gives a twofold classification of conduct and knowledge. But then elsewhere in the same sutra, he says, well, ethics, conduct, and knowledge. Three things. That was this line here. Then in sutra number eight, which I'm now highlighting, he talks about, well, ethics, mind, and wisdom. So instead of conduct, we have mind, chitta. And then finally, in sutra number 10, we get uh, what we expect, which is ethics, shila, meditation, samadhi, and wisdom, prajna, or panya. So what's significant here is right in the beginning, when he's talking about the Eightfold Path, and he's talking about ethics, he categorizes them according to different schema, twofold, threefold, and when it's threefold, there's different, num there's different words. Why is that important? Well, Kion says, apparently, the individual factors of the path, he's speculating, and I agree with him, the individual factors of the path, the eight-fold path, maybe are not so important as the general categories which contain them. To bolster that, he then says, this whole paragraph is worth reading. This is now Kion speaking. In the settled formulation, these are three, morality, meditation, and insight. So he's acknowledging in, in sort of Buddhist Dharma centers throughout history, everybody agrees there's an eightfold path that's divided into these three things. That's settled. Everyone sort of has come to conventionally accept that that's the way we're going to talk about it. It's a heuristic, useful category. But it's also possible to regard these spheres of perfection as binary. That is to say, as founded upon knowledge and conduct, as we saw, or upon morality and insight, shila and prajna. The ambiguity centers on the middle section. That's the one that, where the word keeps changing, you'll notice. Meditation, samadhi. And I suggest that this is because meditation is primarily a means for the promotion of and participation in the basic goods of morality and knowledge. So 
So meditation is not a primary thing. It's something that supports and bolsters and helps give energy to the two things that are really what's at play here, which is ethics and wisdom. The path is best understood in terms of a binary model, that is to say, as the perfection of morality together with the perfection of insight, prajna. Wisdom, samadhi, is a technique for the cultivation of these faculties. And in terms of value structure, the tripartite scheme of shila samadhi prajna can be really actually collapsed into the binary one in the manner described. For instance, as is done in the discourse to Sonadanda, that's sutra number four. One of those sutras, he actually says, does that. So interesting that, you know, traditionally Buddhists throughout history have, for whatever reason, historically decided that the threefold thing is useful. But there's actually a very strong reason to looking at the canonical sources to say, well, actually it seems like what the Buddha was saying is these, the two are the most important and the other one really supports them. And I would agree with this, and I would actually go so far as to suggest, I guess I didn't, I think I type it after here, that therefore practice, in my opinion, does not equal meditation. Practice equals all three, wisdom, ethics, and meditation, the integration of all three. And the reason I'm saying that and highlighting that here in this talk is because all the Dharma centers I've been around and Dharma practitioners I've known and, and worked with over the years, whether from a Zen tradition or a Tibetan tradition or any other tradition, they tend to conflate the idea of practice with meditation. They're synonymous. If you ask somebody, did you practice today? Yes, I got up at 8 in the morning, I did my meditation. Or, oh, I forgot to practice this morning, I'll practice tonight. And I, I think that's a huge mistake. And, and it's not just Kion and me, there's many other, uh, actually when you dig into it, you find this in the writings of Tsongkhapa, you find this in various Zen writings, you find this in, in the Dalai Lama. Many, many will say, in fact, exactly what Kion is saying. Meditation is not only not practice, it's actually, in, some, in many ways, the least important thing. It's something that, you know, and why do we consider it practice? Uh, my own guess is because it's sort of the most exotic thing. When we, when we encounter Buddhism, first of all, you see a statue of a Buddha in a meditation, it looks like that's what Buddhists do, they meditate. And it also sort of exotic ethics, a bunch of lists of do's and don'ts, that's kind of not really something we jump at naturally, usually. Wisdom is pretty difficult to understand, selflessness, it kind of makes some sense maybe, but it's also kind of difficult. But meditation, that's kind of cool. And you can have some pretty far out experiences right off the bat if you start to meditate, even after a few sessions of doing breathing meditation or whatever. And it, makes, it's, and it seems like the most exotic thing and the most unique thing. And therefore, I think Western practitioners tend to make the mistake of thinking that's what Buddhism sort of really is. I'm not denigrating meditation. I'm not saying it doesn't have a part in the path. It has a very important part in the path. But it's a supportive part, not the key part. Not only that, but I would also say, um, actually, up at Columbia, I've, decided, I've divided my courses into these three topics. So we have a course on Buddhist ethics that we're doing this semester. I'll do a course on Buddhist philosophy, which covers wisdom and selflessness, and another course on Buddhist, uh, I call it Buddhist contemplative sciences. And in that latter course on Buddhist contemplative sciences, we actually look at very deeply at this word meditation. And another problem, I'm not going to discuss this now because it's not our topic, but just to mention briefly, the term meditation that we use in the West is actually translating very loosely at least eight or ten different terms in Sanskrit and Tibetan, which mean very, very different things. So the most generic term, if, if that's what you're trying to translate, would be bhavana or gom in Tibetan. And that has to do really, that, the best translation for that would be something like uh, cultivation or integration. It's becoming, actually. You know, it's how, if, if you realize something is the case, and you know it's the case, but you don't see it, you don't, your habit pattern is so strong that you don't live your life that way, you need to bridge that gap. And bhavana, this thing translated as meditation, is a technique for making what you've realized must be the case come into line with your experience of reality. An easy example is, we now know the world is a sphere, it's not flat, but when you walk out the door, it sure looks flat. It still looks flat, and we still act as if the world is flat. So is there, would there be a way to train yourself to actually see the world, see yourself standing on a ball? This is something in the meditation class I mentioned. Uh, Buckminster Fuller actually did this precise thing. He actually came up with a, his own yoga meditation for coming to see himself standing on a ball as opposed to seeing the world as flat. But this is the most generic word. There's many other words that have to do with 
meditative states that have to do with calming the mind. Many types of meditations have to do with an, an, analyzing, being very super analytic and critical. That's Vipassana type meditation. Or Buddha Pratyaveksha, there's many, many terms. Uh, so just calming your mind and sort of spacing out and is not meditation. That's one form of many, many types of things called meditation. Meditation most generally is really cultivation. One form is shamatha, which is calming your mind. Only one. Vipassana, which balances, is real analytic. Lojong has to do with you know, developing compassion and so forth. There's forms of meditation that, um, you know, various yogic meditation, visualizing. A lot of, medit almost all forms of meditation actually have a lot of content. And again, we won't have time to go into this much, at least not tonight. Maybe we'll get into it later, particularly on the fourth night when we're getting into Tantra. There's another common misunderstanding that about what the term non-conceptuality means. And this is important really throughout Buddhism. It comes up in Kamala Shila's writing in the 8th century in, in India. It's a central focus of the great debate that formulates, is, is foundational for the forming of Tibetan Buddhism in the 8th, 9th century. Uh, so these debates are part of the Buddhist discourse of what does it mean, what does non-conceptuality mean? And a key here is does non-conceptuality just mean not thinking, having a blank mind, or does it mean something else? And Kamala Shila and many others have argued very strongly on the basis of Buddhist sutras and also on the basis of their own experience and also on the basis of analysis and argumentation that blanking out your mind and, and having no thoughts is not only non-conceptual, not only is that not non-conceptuality, it's not what the Buddha means when he says the Buddha mind is non-conceptual. Not only is it not that, but it actually he heads you off in a nihilistic direction that's actually counter to liberation. It's actually not what you want. The reason I'm bringing up the topic of non-conceptuality in this context is, of course, because, again, many people tend to think, if, they're not, if they don't learn this, that meditation means somehow being non-conceptual. It means stopping thinking. Thinking is somehow bad. I just have to stop thinking and, and somehow float or watch my breath and allow my thoughts to drift away. There's one type of meditation where that's important to do, shamatha, but you're doing it for a very specific reason. It's not because con concepts are bad. It's because you're trying to gain control over what concepts happen when they do or don't. You're just trying to get your mind under more control, get it more focused. So I'm just putting that here for the sake of uh, pointing that out. Practice does not mean meditation. Talk about Buddhist practice, if anything, it means wisdom and, and ethics. And that means it's 24-7. It means uh, not doing those 10 things or doing the 10 positive things. It's not just not doing, right? The Buddha said don't harm others, but also try to be good. It means actively looking for opportunities to give to others. Not, you're not just taking what's not given, you're actually looking for opportunities to give. That doesn't only mean material wealth or food, it can mean giving advice, giving solace, uh, and so forth. It can mean giving anything, giving your time. So you're looking for opportunities to give, you're looking for opportunities to save lives. And uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and others in contemporary forms of uh, Buddhism have his order of interbeing, which is a wonderful name, a wonderful order. He's come up with his sangha, has really developed, has really expanded on the idea of, of each of these. What does it mean to not kill, for example? And they've expanded the idea beyond just taking life to, me, to, to having to do with killing others' uh, hope, uh, killing the environment, you know, in other words, ecological, uh, raping the environment and so forth, any kind of violence, basically. Uh, and he's likewise expanded, his, he and his sangha as a group have expanded what it means to take what is not given, and so forth. So thinking about each of these 10 on a moment-by-moment -moment basis and acting accordingly, that's a 24-7 job, and you do it even when you're asleep. So if you want to talk about Buddhist practice, Buddhist practice means that. And if you can do all of that in a way that's informed by wisdom, so much the better. And as we'll see on the third talk, I think it is, when we're getting into Mahayana ethics, um, we will discuss the six perfections. And we'll see that the sixth perfection of wisdom is integral it's to what makes the other five perfections. So generosity, ethics, tolerance, uh, energetic perseverance, and meditation, none of those are perfections if they're not informed by and infused by wisdom. Wisdom is what makes them perfections. So likewise here, if all Buddhist practice, even at the foundational level, is ethics and wisdom, minimum is you do the ethics 24-7. To the extent that, that, eth that your ethics can be infused with or informed by some understanding of wisdom, of selflessness, so much the better. It starts to become less world-oriented and more transcendent-oriented. 
It tends to create karma that doesn't just ripen as good karma to you, where you get to be born in a nice family in a nice lifetime, etc. Sort of things that sort of develop for you. It actually develops you more spiritually. It becomes more merit and less just good karma. Uh, actually, we'll discuss that right now because this topic is next on my list. I'll be stopping in just a minute here, probably to take questions and have conversation. I find this list extremely helpful. Um, and this list is throughout many, many sutras and throughout many traditions. Tibetan lamas uh, talk about it. It shows up in the Garjana's text that we just had up here a minute ago. The eight worldly obsessions or preoccupations. The word here is dharmas, the eight worldly dharmas. But the word dharma can be translated so many different ways, at least 18 ways in different contexts. Here it means something like obsession or preoccupation. And there's four sets of two. There are pairs. Gain and loss are paired. And here I put the Tibetan terms. Uh, numbers three and four, pleasure and pain, or happiness and unhappiness. Five and six are praise and blame, and seven and eight are fame and disgrace. And what this means, this is a list of eight things, eight sort of criteria you can use to evaluate your own state of mind and your own actions when you're doing anything. So when you're doing or not doing those 10 things, or anything else for that matter, you can evaluate what is your motivation. And it's not either or, it's not black or white, it's more of a spectrum. But the point of this list is to think, it's an extra added sort of layer to think about, to the extent to which your giving food to an animal, or giving money to a monastery, or giving advice to a friend, right? To the extent to which you're doing that because, either intentionally, like, like very clearly, or maybe subliminally, unconsciously, the extent to which you're doing it because you're concerned about your own being praised, or you don't want somebody to blame you. To that extent, that act, it's still a good act, it's a meritorious act, it's a wonderful act, you get praised for it, you get brownie points for it, but it's a worldly act. What does worldly mean? What worldly means is it's a samsaric act. The kind of karma or positive energy that that act is now generating is, has an effect within the, within the samsaric realm. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. And again, Nagarjuna, as some of you may have heard the talk we, I gave on his um, jeweled rosary, a big point of that book is to say Buddhist ethics falls into two broad categories. There's an entire category that has to do with uh, what can be called ascendance. It has to do with actions that help you ascend within samsara, have a better life, get a better rebirth, have more resources. There's nothing wrong with having money and food and shelter and a nice body with all your senses intact. That's a great. And in fact, in the Mahayana, you wish for that for others. You don't only wish that they go on and become Buddhas. Yes, that's a great transcendent thing they get, you can hope for someday. But even in the short run, you shouldn't be blind to or, you know, callous to their immediate needs. If you're a compassionate, sensitive being, you immediately want the suffering being in front of you to not be cold. It has nothing to do with attaining enlightenment. It's just you don't want them to be cold or hungry. So you give them shelter, you give them clothing, you give them food. So wanting people to be happy or wanting sentient beings to be happy on a mundane level, there's nothing wrong with it. That is a form of Buddhist ethics. And it's considered the kind of karma that's in that realm so if your own karma ripens, if you do things colored by these eight worldly obsessions, that kind of act will create a kind of energy that will ripen for you in a positive way in terms of your own wealth, good conditions, and so forth. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not, it's not transcendent. So Nagarjuna, again, in that book, distinguishes between ascendant and transcendent levels of ethics and behavior. If you want to talk about transcendent, what kind of actions will actually help me transcend samsara? And again, this doesn't mean going somewhere else. Nirvana, he's very clear in this book and many other books that the notion of nirvana or liberation is not a notion of sort of going away somewhere else. It's really a question of transforming your experience. Samsara is essentially a nightmare that we're creating. And it's waking up from that nightmare. You're still in life. You're still engaging in life. But you're engaging in an awake way instead of a, a sleep nightmare way. So if you want that kind of transcendent experience, then to the extent to which your ethical actions are not tainted by these, to that extent, it's a transcendent act. So imagine giving some food to someone, let's say, and when you're giving that food to them, you have no thought whatsoever about your own gain or loss, like, oh, God, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to, this is going to cost me something. Now, it's one thing also just to give, you know, no problem, give 25 cents. But if it really hurts, if it's like giving more than is comfortable, that it's within your own zone of proximal development. The, these questions come up 
when you're pushing your own envelope, right? It's not when it's easy and comfortable. But if you're pushing your own envelope and you're pushing, you're giving a little bit more than you're comfortable with, but you can do so in a way where you're not even thinking about what am I losing or what will I gain from this? You're not even thinking about, it's not even occurring to you, am I going to get praised or blamed if I do it this way or that? I'm not thinking about my own happiness, my own karmic thing, or my own happiness. I'm not thinking about, and by the way, praise and blame are, are more immediate, and fame and disgrace are kind of the same thing, but on a more general public level, right? I'm not even thinking about that. And think, this is, it's a helpful list to have, but think about it. That's not that different than Christian ethics or any other kind of ethics in the West. A truly selfless act in a Christian tradition would probably be described the same way. You're not, you're not coming from that ego point of view, what, what's in it for me? So this is just a helpful list of things to kind of keep in mind and to try to weed out. And maybe you notice one of these eight is more predominant, more your obsession than some of the other seven. So then you start focusing on that. You say, you know, maybe I'm really hung up on, on being famous. So you try, to, you try to do things in a way that, um, where you don't, you're not going to get fame and you try to be detached from the fame piece of it. Shantideva, again, is wonderful when you read the Shantideva's book on the guy to Bodhisattva's way of life. When he's talking, he's arguing with his own mind, and his own, his own ego starts having a dialogue with him, trying to, it's how the ego works, trying to like come up with exceptions. Like, well, no, I don't want the fame for myself, but if I get famous, I'll be able to spread the Dharma that much more, and it'll benefit lots of beings, so probably it would be good if I became famous. It's all these kinds of you know, incredible calculations. And then he argues back with himself, like, no, you don't, you know, forget. Yes, on some rational level, that's true. But right now, I'm, my main focus is I'm trying to rid myself of the ego. And then the ego is now trying to insinuate its way into my spiritual practice. So no. A lot of mind training, uh, lojong in, in the Tibetan tradition, is this kind of practice. It's learning how to be hypervigilant about the kinds of tricks that the ego plays to, give you, to kind of give you some spiritual wiggle room. And just, no, cut it out. And it really helps you learn to be really, truly selfless. So all of the 10 basic kinds of ethics we've been talking about are good by themselves. They're ascendant. To the extent to which they can be stripped away of the eight worldly concerns or obsessions, then they become transcendent. And I think that's probably where we'll stop for now. This is now getting into the talk for uh, Thursday. Uh, the four objects of contemplation that orient one towards a spiritual life, going for refuge, object of refuge, dharmas and four insignia. Yeah, this is now getting into uh, Thursday's conversation. And let me see if there's anything else on this page I wanted to cover today. Again, this will be Thursday. Thursday, probably. Getting into renunciation. Yeah, so that gives you a quick overview of basic ethics. Since tonight is supposed to be, um, I'll just spend a couple more minutes. It's 8.25. We go till 9, right? Um, I'll spend just a couple more minutes, since tonight is an overview of all three nights, um, giving you some highlights about the ethics of the other two forms of uh, Buddhist practice, or of the other two vehicles. So individual vehicle, which is mainly, we've been discussing foundational, that cent you know, center circle so far. It really comes down to ethics and wisdom. And the reason why the word uh, renunciation is here, we'll discuss that much more on Thursday. Renunciation is kind of a negative term. It really has to do with turning, turning away from samsara. What this means is turning away from the addictions we were talking about, turning away from the ego perspective towards a selfless perspective. That is the foundational practice of individual vehicle Buddhism, which we spent most of the night talking about. So we won't discuss more of that right now. Universal vehicle Buddhism, which we'll be discussing more in the subsequent session, takes that as its core and adds a couple things to it. It adds love and compassion are certainly part of even fundamental Buddhism. In universal uh, level Buddhism, compassion becomes what's called great compassion. And great compassion then gets sort of, and there's a difference between great compassion and compassion. We'll discuss that on that night. And then great compassion, segues into something even bigger called bodhicitta, or the mind of awakening, or the spirit of awakening, bodhi mind. Um, and we'll be discussing that at some length. But in short, there's two way, actually two sets of two ways to break down bodhicitta. The one that's most relevant um, will be what's considered aspirational bodhicitta and engaging bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, or the mind of awakening, is, is essentially 
having, decide, having understood the Four Noble Truths for oneself, having recognized that your own addictions are in fact the key to your own suffering. And again, this is a question of to the extent to which you understand that. And this is not easily, you can, under, you can study Buddhism for a year and basically get it and say, yeah, I sign on, this works for me, this is the path I want to follow. That's great. That doesn't mean that you don't understand that on a deeper and deeper level. And I can say for myself, after you know, almost 40 years, I, I, it keeps getting so much deeper. And I think about you know, the, way, the way in which I was thinking about it or understanding it two years ago, and it was so shallow by comparison. And if that happens enough, eventually you get very, very humble. And you say, OK, this is going to go on for, forever. So I'm not going to pretend that I understand the depth of this. What, is, what does it mean to say that misknowledge, desire, and hatred is the cause of my suffering? That you can come to a deeper and deeper understanding of this and go on for a long time. But to whatever extent you've sort of personally come to that, own, that conclusion, if you then recognize that not only is that causing my suffering, but you also recognize the other four truths, the other three truths, that it's actually possible to uproot that and stop that, and the possibility of liberation is actually something that initially intellectually sounds real and plausible, and eventually maybe through flashes of experience you start to see the possibility of that. Maybe you meet somebody like, like a Dalai Lama who seems to embody that. And that can be a very profound teaching in and of itself, just to meet somebody who's at a much more advanced level. Without a word spoken, you sort of go, oh, that's, there's something, now, okay, now I see, you know, there's something way ahead of, down the path that I need to go. And that's inspiring. So to the extent to which you've sort of seen that, to whatever extent you've seen that for yourself as an individual, and you recognize my own liberation is possible, and I'm the one holding myself back, and it, but it is possible for me to be liberated from this and actually be free, then when you turn that insight onto someone else, initially someone else you love and care about, you know, maybe a parent or a child, but eventually in the Mahayana, the reason why it's called the universal vehicle is because the, the goal is to start to develop that aspiration that everyone, without exception, have that same freedom. And so Bodhi mind, the mind of awakening, is precisely the mind that takes that, that insight into self-liberation and wants to, aspires to apply that to others. It's the wish, I want to not only do this for myself, now I'm beginning to see this is possible. But it's not just enough for me to do it as an individual. I don't want to leave you behind, my dear mother or father. And so, but I recognize that I can't, um, I can't help a, a given individual if they, are, if they themselves are completely boxed in and in the dark and buying into their own ego and so forth. So I, I realize their own suffering, the only way this person, the individual who I care about deeply, is going to be free of their own suffering is if they themselves come to the same realization. I can't just tell it to them. They have to come to it themselves. So now I'm inspired and motivated to actually help the specific other individual come to that same level. And that might take many years. It might take many lifetimes. You might have a very, very stubborn grandfather who just is not going to listen. So you might take 10, but you don't give up because it's your grandfather and you love him. So you spend, you know, little by little chipping away, trying different angles, trying different approaches. This is what's called upaya or skillful means, skill and liberative technique. This is what the bodhisattva in the Mahana vehicle wants to do, cares about. This is their ethic. How, what, what, what can I do to help this other individual wake up? What skills do I need to develop to help them do that? And the inconceivable patience and tolerance to do this, not only for minutes and hours and days and years, but for lifetimes, in fact, how many lifetimes it takes. What comes with this necessarily, I would say, and we can discuss this if you want, but I would say it's integral to both individual vehicle and universal vehicle Buddhism, this multi-life perspective. The idea that we can be Buddhists and just here and now and sort of existential, that's fine. I mean, you can do, Buddhism can certainly be nurturing for people on a here and now level. But as long as the idea of multiple lives is not considered, I would say the horizon is much, much limited. And what I would also suggest is that the, the, the concept of multiple lives, a little bit counterintuitively, actually comes the more you recognize the nature of selflessness, as opposed to the other way around. You would think that, you know, well, it, you have to have a self to be reborn, right? Actually, if you have a self, you, you're stuck and you can't be reborn. And precisely because you don't have a self, and what is going on is sort of a constant process, like a candle flame, the notion of a continuity starts to make more sense. So the notion of, a, of an infinite horizon of lifetimes 
of conscious, not just consciousness, it's mind and body, starts to make more sense. And it's suddenly the, the possibility of, spir of deep spiritual progress also starts to make more sense because, oh, I don't have to do this all in the next 40 years or I'll, you know, I, can, I can do as much as I can in the next 40 years, but I'll pick up where I left off from, hopefully. And that's why in Mahana practice in particular, but in both vehicles, um, there's, there's a lot of it has to do with vows, or, or prayers rather, dedication prayers, that, you know, I know I'm going to die someday, and when I die, you know, may I be reborn in such and such a context where I can pick up my Dharma practice where I left off and continue. That becomes like prime goal number one. That's the, that's the investment bank that you put your karma into. That's what dedicating merit's about. It's taking this sort of loose, free, positive energy, the good karma, and saying, no, I want to deposit that in the bank of dharma so that it, the only way it's allowed to ripen, it's like a certain kind of investment, it can only ripen for me in a way that is productive for my own dharma practice. And, you know, if you do that your whole life, the idea is, is that because intention is part of karma, that's how that karma will manifest. So then your spiritual practice continues where you left off. It could be very different. You might be a male or a female next life. You might spend a few lifetimes because of some weird karma that has to work its way through as a pet dog some, you know, for a while. You might end up uh, in, in, a bad, in a country that's you know, war-torn and you can't practice dharma. There's, you can have a human embodiment and not be conducive to dharma practice or not be optimal if war is going on or dharma's books have not existent. So again, we'll talk about this on Thursday this week about the 18 conditions of a perfect human life, which is what one hopes for. But so the multi-life perspective ho helps. Mahayana ethics then has to do with this bodhicitta. That's what distinguishes it, really. That one thing is bodhicitta, which is the mind of awakening, the expanding of one's own ethics and one's own liberation towards another being, and then eventually several other beings. And eventually, and this is the hard part, without discrimination at all, every single sentient being you encounter. That's the bodhisattva, that's real bodhicitta. And that is, after all, what a Buddha is. A Buddha is actually, that is the, the fruition of that. A bodhisattva becomes a Buddha. A Buddha is someone who cares without discrimination. It doesn't matter what you do to him. You can punch him in the face, you can steal, whatever. He only cares about you, he or she or it only cares about your well-being and your optimum flourishing as a sentient being, completely selflessly. So a bodhisattva wants to be that. Well, how do you get to be that? You have to practice it. You have to actually practice being selfless and practice the non-discriminative part of compassion. That's actually the hard part. So as a practicing Tibetan Buddhist or practicing Mahayana Buddhist, frankly, and this is real practice, this is practice in the trenches, not on the cushion, this is really the hard part. And it's easy to say all sentient beings, you know, may all sentient beings, it's difficult, may each and every sentient being. And then take that when you walk out the door and somebody accosts you on the street or, or you go back home and that, that person that you've been living with for 10 years who just gets under your skin and they just annoy the heck out of you. To be able to get past that, so either the person who attacks you on the street you've never met before, or the person you know too well and they just really bother you now, you have to get past that and actually feel 100% that you, you have so much compassion for that individual as much compassion as you have for the individual who's just poor and pathetic and suffering or who did you a great favor yesterday or whatever. No discrimination. That's bodhicitta. So bodhicitta is the will to attain enlightenment or Buddhahood for the sake of helping every other sentient being do the same. That's bodhicitta. That'll be discussed two sessions from now. Tantric ethics then, again, is really just Mahayana. It's, it's, all Tantra is, is is the same, the exact same in terms of the view of emptiness, it's not different. In terms of uh, all these ethics we've discussed, it's not different. So this is, as you can see here, Bodhisattva vows, we'll be discussing that. Um, esoteric or Vajrayana Buddhism, then really the main difference there is you're incorporating a different kind of meditative practice called deity yoga, in which you're imagining yourself as a Buddha. It's kind of like called the fake it till you make it vehicle. You're, in, you're imagining, rather than thinking Buddhahood's far away and you're working towards getting there, on the one hand, you acknowledge that's the case. On another level, you, you sort of acknowledge that there's a way in which you already are there. There's sort of a level of Buddha nature that's already there that hasn't maybe fully awakened. There's a number of techniques in which you tap into that on a deep level. You tap into your inner Buddha, so, so to speak. And you sort of assume that, and you visualize that, and you take the responsibility for being a Buddha here and now. And that entails all sorts of uh, visualization practices, as you probably know, 
mantras and so forth. We'll be discussing what that practice is about. But in terms of the ethics connected to that, interestingly, the main kind of ethics there has to do with uh, this. It, like I say, it's all of the above plus, so all the other kinds of ethics plus, data yoga entails taking responsibility for your perceptions and your constructions. Do you see that guy in front of you as just a jerk? That Oh, there's, there's that guy again. Or do you see him as a bodhisattva? Do you see him as a Buddha? Do you see her as a Buddha? You're actually taking con control, you're using your emptiness realization to recognize that how you connect the dots is something that's up to you. And there's actually an ethical obligation if you recognize that, that you are responsible for how you create your interactions with others. You become ethically required from, from within. You feel required to relate to the best in that other person. And again, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's like seeing that of God in everyone. So data yoga entails taking responsibility for your perceptions and constructions, and therefore the kinds of vows and ethics having to have to do with avoiding ordinary perceptions and conceptions. You basically develop extraordinary perception and conception. You see your own body as a Buddha, you see others as a Buddha, and the vows and ethics that have to do there have to do with taking that on, taking on that responsibility to do that. So before it was moment by moment, you're still doing the moment by moment assessing your mind you know, about the 10 non-virtues and about the eight worldly obsessions, but now you're even going more fine-grained than that. You're saying, and am I reifying this person as a evil person or a mean person or as my best friend, or am I not doing that and actually seeing everyone as a potential Buddha? So that's tantric ethics in a nutshell. And then that gets broken down. And it's when you actually start, if you've ever taken initiation, you've read some of the tantric vows, there's a huge, long, dizzying list of vows. And it, it can seem like there's all over the map. What's the organizing scheme? I think it helps to know this kind of thing. This is the kind of thing that Tsongkhapa argues in his uh, Stages of the Path of Mantra, for example. There's a book that we'll be looking at called Tantric Ethics, which is a translation of a book he wrote as well. But it helps to, to, to give some organizing scheme to all the crazy tantric vows to say, yes, there's all these vows that have to do with visualizing things this way and seeing this part of your body or mind that way and doing mantras. And Why? Is it because of some ritual magic that works? No, it's because it has to do with this. It has to do with taking control of your conceptions. And on a deeper level, we won't have time to get into this, but um, a book that I've, one book I've translated and published and another book I'm working on discusses even the physics of this, the subtle psychophysics of why it is that specific visualizations, they're not just random, they're not culturally specific either. They, they're, all of these visualizations and mantras are tied into specific subtle structures in the psychophysical complex in ways that activate those. So you're activating very, very subtle states of body and mind in ways that are optimal, that help you uproot your kleshas, actually, on a very, very subtle, subliminal, almost unconscious level. So that's Tantra in a, in a nutshell. Um, so OK, we've got 20 minutes left. I've given you an overview of, of Buddhist ethics and what we're going to do in the next three sessions. We'll go into more depth. But now I'd like to hear your thoughts or questions. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, many lamas will tell you, you know, be very, very mindful of oh. the concept of dedicating merit. Many lamas will tell you, be very mindful, whatever you do, dedicate the merit. Yeah. Build, build your merit field um, <clears throat> so you can become enlightened. And I was thinking about this idea with the worldly obsessions mm. and uh, motivation. So what if I'm on the subway and some guy is begging and I have $5 and I have $20? Yeah. <laughs> and then I say, well, you know, I'm going to give him $5. It's enough. But then I say, you know, if I give 20 and dedicate the merit, that will be really good for me. Right. So could you comment on that? Because I have had those thoughts in my sure, life. Sure, yeah, yeah. Thank you. The, those, um, the whole question of – there's actually two parts of the question here. One, one part of the question, to address that first, kind of at the end – has to do with, and I mentioned this in another talk I gave, I think it might have been the last one here, about, um, I like to use, borrow from uh, the Russian psychologist Vygotsky this term he coined called the zone of proximal development. The what? He called it the zone of proximal development. Oh. Now, this is a, a Russian psychologist. And what he was talking about was in psychology, when you're a therapist working with somebody to help them move, you know, move past a neurosis um, or whatever, 
if you ask them if they're here and they've got this problem, this hang up, this neurosis, and you ask them and you clearly see that healthy is way over here, and you say, okay, what you need to do is stop doing this and start doing this, that's just way out of, that's just out of their reach. They can't even grasp what that means. Or maybe they grasp it, it they're going to fail no matter what, and it's going to frustrate them. So this is asking too much. On the other hand, if all you ask them for is sort of, okay, you're here, why don't you just do this? It's great, they can do that, but you know, they could have done more. And they could have actually advanced more if you'd asked them. So figuring out as a good therapist, what is the, what he calls a zone of proximal development? It's a zone of development that's proximal, that's near to you, near to where you're at. It sort of takes where you're at and pushes your envelope, so to speak. So in terms of, there's actually a lot written about this kind of thing, about assessing your own. Number one, a llama will do this with you and for you. But also, it's important to develop your own inner sense of what is your own zone of proximal development and to be honest about it. And this is written a lot about in Shantideva, in Nagarjuna. It comes up throughout the mind training texts, the Lojong texts. Um, this specific topic is talked about, that you need to not because you're inspired and now you want to become a Buddha, now you're going to like throw your body in front of the tigress and feed, feed your, the Buddha did that, right? He fed his body to a hungry tigress so the tigress wouldn't eat her cubs. Well, great, I'm going to do that because I'm you know, gung-ho today. If you do that when you die or when, or when you're being eaten by the tiger, because you're not actually to the level where you can do that selflessly and with compassion, you're suddenly going to be angry and why did I do this and the Buddha was wrong and I mean, all sorts of negative stuff is going to come up. And it was a mistake. You shouldn't have gone that far. So it's like, I mean, on a micro level, with a $5 and a $20 bill, there, there's a question of assessing that. And of course, you can do the calculus of, well, you know, you give the $5 now, but the $20, maybe you'll meet a more needy beggar on the next subway stop. I mean, you can come up with all sorts of reasons why you shouldn't give the 20 And it's not a right or wrong answer. It's not like you, neither is right or wrong. The, the very practice of assessing that and asking the fact you're asking yourself the question about the five or the twenty, and why am I hanging on to the twenty? Is it because I, you know, that's part of the practice itself. How you resolve that? There's no answer. It's not like you should give the twenty. That's up to you and your own zone of proximal development. And the other thing to mention here is that there is a phase, there is a kind of practice that, again, in lojong and mind training, it's kind of like bodhisattva boot camp. We'll maybe discuss this when we do the bodhisattva piece of it on two sessions from now. There, there is a point that a person reaches for a phase in their development, and it could be a day, it could be a year, it could be many lifetimes. There's a, there's a point when you reach where you're, you're actual, you're so convinced that, and Shantideva is actually the, one of the root texts for this. It's a, it's a genre of literature that develops immensely in Tibet, but they point back to Shantideva's text, and these two texts actually, Nagarjuna's Jewel Rosary and Shantideva's Guide for the Bodhisattva Life is the key texts that are the seeds for this kind of training, where you, you, you come to a point where you say, the number one thing for me now developmentally, and it kind of trumps everything else, is I need to get over my hang up on what, whatever ex, you know, excuse I come up with about hanging on to something, no, I'm going to give it away. If a person is at that level, and it's a rare and very advanced level, then no matter what, the beggar comes up and asks you for your hand, you say, great, you cut off your hand and you give it to him. I mean, literally, they have the stories like this in the Buddha's life stories and so forth, but it's a very, very advanced level. And if you're not able to give away part of your body, and again, Shantideva discusses that exact example, he says, okay, look, if you're not at a point where you're able to give away your, your figure out what you are able to give away, but give it, you get, reach a point where that is your practice. No questions asked, it's immediate, and whatever, whatever the ego comes up with, you know, clever excuses or examples or reasons. No, I've decided in advance, like you wake up in the morning, it's like a New Year's resolution or something. You decide in advance that this is my practice now to, to counter this aspect of my ego. I'm going to do this no matter what. But what if your motivation is like, you can okay, afford so both. The, the other part of your question I can then, build more merit, right. so here, take the The other the part of your question has to do with that issue of, uh, is it my merit and, you know, does it help me and, and et cetera. Again, the, 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 dedication, the dedication of merit, there's two ways to look at that. One is, if it really is dedicating the merit, you're giving that away. In fact, that's, again, part of a lot of Mahayana practice. You not only give the person the food or the money, but you also give them the merit. And you think that and you say that. And then even that later that night, you think back about what I do today. Oh, yeah, I gave that guy the thing. You again dedicate the merit. You say whatever good merit, and a lot of Mahayana prayers 
are spelled out that way. They show you how to think about it. Right in the back of Shanti Deva, in the back of here, you read the, you read the dedication prayers. Um, in, the, in the end of uh, the Avatamsaka Sutra, there's the, what is extracted as the prayer of Samantabhadra, which is said in many Dharma centers. Looking at those kinds of dedication prayers are helpful um, sort of formula for helping train you to how to think about that. And you'll notice that a lot of those prayers, you give away the merit. So may this merit, and Lojong has to do with it, Tonglen, if you know Tonglen to practice, you're taking on everyone else's suffering and you're giving them your, your merits. So one way to think about it is that, you give away the merit. Um, and of course, it's understood that there's sort of a, a trick here. There's kind of an irony here, or a something, something like a spiritual trick in a way, but it's not really a trick if it's done authentically. The trick is, is that by acting that selflessly, not only give away whatever was hard, but you also give away the merit. If you're actually doing that, and you're not being held back by the eight worldly dharmas, like, well, secretly, I know I'm going to become a Buddha by doing this. By, by actually just sort of giving it all away really selflessly, that in itself constitutes Buddha behavior. That in itself creates the conditions that will start to wake you up. You actually, so the more selfless you act, the more selfless you become. It becomes sort of a snowball effect. And Thank there you. was there was one oh yeah the other that was the other the other way of answering that which is the way the Dalai Lama sometimes answers it is that he calls it wise selfish yeah, yeah. It, there's nothing wrong with being wise selfish it's being in other words it's going to benefit you in a way but it doesn't benefit you in the in the samsaric ego way it benefits you in the transcendent liberation way and there's and there's nothing wrong with it benefiting you in fact again Nagarjuna's book this book here and all Mahayana books talk about two benefits there's benefit to self and benefit to others there's nothing wrong with you benefit. After all, the individual vehicle is about the Four Noble Truths, is about you attaining your own liberation. You, you yourself have to become liberated. You want to be. There's nothing wrong with you being liberated and happy. You should be liberated and happy. So it's not either or. Yes? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I was just thinking, I think even dedication of merit can get tricky. Yes? Right, because we like to think, well, I'm just going to give you all my good thoughts and my best wishes, blah 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 blah. But you don't get merit unless you purify. Right. And you don't and you don't purify unless you renounce, and you don't renounce unless you recognize. Right. Right. So it gets tricky. Yes. So I find like the whole connection between ethos and enlightenment very interesting because when it comes down to it, at the time of death, if you're a Vajrayana practitioner, if you're a yogi, if you are whatever. What do you got? You got your merit. Mm -hmm. Wisdom, merit, 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 right? Mm -hmm. We think, well, we're gonna, uh, what's a good way to go? Peacefully in our sleep, surrounded by family and loved ones, right? Reciting, uh, you know, doing one's practice and meditation. Well, what about when you're hit by a bus, mm -hmm. right? That's it, right. right? You don't even have a split second. You know, even you think, physiologists say you have 10 seconds of oxygen left in your brain, right? right to do this, this, and this. It's like, that's all you got. So I find that the whole connection between ethos and enlightenment actually very interesting. More so the way, the way I like to think about it, and again, I sometimes do this in classes when I'm trying to teach karma. It's, 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 I mentioned that karma is a really difficult topic, and karma is connected to merit. Karma, just for one thing, just to separate, there is the notion of karma, good and bad karma. When you look at the Tibetan Wheel of Life, you know, in the very center you have the three addictions, mm. the, the, the black pig, the snake, and the rooster, which represent the three addictions. <laughs> Next ring out you have a a white half of a circle and a black half of a circle. And the white half, you have people going up, and the black half, you have people falling down in that circle. If you look at the Wheel of Life, Tibetan Wheel of Life, it's called, it should be called the Tibetan and Wheel of Life. Sequ it's not sequential either. Well, it's a circle. It is, you have right. people going up on the white side and falling down on the black side. But in terms of how, I mean, I don't know anything, but my understanding is just that the circle doesn't go through one through 12 steps. No, you're thinking of something different. That's on the very outside where you have the 12 okay. links of the interdependent origination. Okay. On the very inside, in the, in the hub, you have the three addictions. Right. And then the next ring out right there, before you even get to the six realms, you have white and black. Now, that represents good and bad karma. And the fact that there, there's pictures of people sort of floating up in the white half means good karma does what? Good karma makes you go up within samsara. You go up into a human realm, maybe into a god realm. The black side, bad, bad karma, you're going to fall down into the animal realm, ghost realm, hell realms. And what that's showing or saying, among other things, is that the whole talk about karma has to do with samsara. So it's not the case that a whole bunch of good karma is what gets you to Buddhahood. A whole bunch of good karma, karma is by definition ego-based. A whole bunch of good karma gets you into a really good position in samsara. So merit's a funny thing, because merit, in order to actually be merit, 
has to be devoid of, has to be emptied of self. And again, it's not either or, it's not either it is or it isn't, at least the way I understand it. It's, it's a spectrum. So to, to some extent, if you do a really good act, and it would normally just, if you just, if you, even if you weren't a Buddhist, there would be some positive energy associated with that that's going to ripen to you karmically within samsara. If you have some understanding of this sort of cause and effect and you have some understanding of selflessness and the possibility of liberation, then by taking that good act and your intention even while you're doing it, it's not just after the fact dedication. This is part of, part of maybe your, what makes you uncomfortable and I would agree. It's not just after the fact dedication like this thing, like this coin has been minted and now you're going to put it in the deposit box. Karma is much more continuous. While you're doing the act, while you're giving the food, what is your state of mind? How selfless is it? The karma is there, the merit is there, it's part of the energy. That's why, again, I like to use the potential energy thing with picking up the eraser. And another analogy I like to use is shooting an arrow through the sky. Um, that every act you do is like shooting an arrow. Or it's like pushing the, the spaceship, the astronaut, you know, pushing the spaceship. It's some sort of a trajectory, it's almost like a vector, momentum, right? And it's, so it's not a thing. Your merit, you're either your good karma or if it's selfless, becomes more meritorious. It's more of an orientation. It's a kind of an energy, uh, a momentum, a direction, a vector that you, you don't have it. It's just what you are, actually. You're now going in that direction. So it's not something you have as much as it's kind of who you are. So as was said earlier, ethics constitutes you as a Buddha, but it also constitutes you as a normal sentient being. Your merit, unripened merit, kind of constitutes who you are. And, but because karma, all action, one of the most determinative aspects of any action is the intention involved. If your intention is enlightenment, Buddhahood, Nirvana, etc., to whatever extent you understand that, to that extent, it's a different kind of, it's an unworldly act. It's a transworldly act, transmundane act. And so now it, it's, it's, it, it is what it is. It's not, it's not like you're putting something in a bank. That's why that is sort of a bad analogy. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if that helps. I hope it helps. But you're right, the whole thing of dedicating a merit, in some Buddhist countries, it does get very materialistic and even silly. I mean, you see lay Buddhists, it becomes almost like an economy. You know, I'm gonna give this much money to the, mo to the monastery because I'm gonna get this kind of merit, and it becomes this strange economy, like, like a bank account kind of thing, in sort of the lay understanding of it. But in a deeper level, as I understand it, it's, it's something more like this kind of energy. Uh, or momentum or direction that constitutes who, who you are, who you're becoming. Hello, Professor. Thank you Hi. for your talk. Um, I have a question about um, compassion for others versus compassion for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so if, you know, um, to some degree, in my understanding, you need your ego or sense of self to kind of propel you to meditate or uh, be compassionate towards others. There has to be kind of this like impetus um, which kind of hangs on some sense of self. Like you want self-development uh, and you're gonna do these practices and you need kind of a vehicle, like a sense, like a self vehicle to kind of move you through these practices and then ultimately dissolve itself maybe. Um, mm. And, you know, on this path, you know, if you, you know, it can be problematic because, like, what if, you know, you're on the subway and you're accosted by someone, or say, like, someone asks you to move, like, you're standing in my spot, and there's no reason this person should be asking you to move. Now, <laughs> what... <laughs> It's happened to me the other day. Sounds, um, yeah. So, in that scenario, how much you know? How much should we you be looking out for yourself? You know, it, it's not that there's a problem with moving for this other person, right. but you know, what about the person that's standing there already? Sure. Yeah. I, I'm sure. I, I I personally struggle with that all the time. That exact question, and it, it is a it's a my own understanding of it is that it really it. What, it's not that there's an answer, again, like, oh, well, you should move, or you should. The process, the, the, the fact that you're thinking about that and asking that question is important. And the next 10 times that that happens to you, and it probably will happen to you 10 more times, um, five times you might do this, and five times you might do that. What's important is what are you, what are you, what's going on with each of those times? Are you thinking, well, I'm not going to move for that jerk? Or are you thinking, well, I could move for him, 
but then what would I be teaching him? I would be, I would be, I would be bolstering his narcissism. Maybe it'll be better to teach him a lesson. You know, are you teaching him a lesson or are you actually showing him? So there can be, you know, in the in in Vajrayana practice, compassion, you know, or any spiritual quality can take on four different forms, and hence you have four classes of deities. You know, that sort of personified as four deities. So compassion can be peaceful, and what we think of as compassion, sweet and kind and loving. But compassion can also have a fierce face, or a powerful face, or an expansive face. Four classes of deities. So there is something called fierce compassion. We all, have, any of us who have kids, know you sometimes have to express fierce compassion. And hopefully, if you do it well, there's no anger in it whatsoever. There's no hatred or anger. It needs to have not, none of that in it in terms of the motivation. But in terms of the presentation, it can be very fierce. It can be very, you know, da 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 da. So there may be a context in which, depending on your own motivation, where you're coming from, and you have to assess that. When the guy wants the, and you have to obsess if he's safe or crazy, you know. But if you think it's an appropriate context and you think you're not coming from an ego perspective, and you think it actually would help him to learn that no, you can't just push people around and take their seats, then maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't give up your seat. Maybe the most compassionate thing you could do, but this is a question of skillful means, of bodhisattva's skillful means. What could you do to show that person that what they just did was really inappropriate and rude? And they should actually learn to be more compassionate themselves. Is there a way you can do something, say something, act in a certain, project a certain energy, where the net outcome is that person realizes, oh, I was being rude, I shouldn't. Then that's a great, then, then that's good. You've done a good thing. So I don't know if that's answering your question. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's part of the calculus. I mean, it, the, all of this has to do with sort of asking these questions. An, yes. There's another, dimension, there's another dimension, I think, to her question is how yes. does she show compassion for herself? Yeah. And so um, That's I'm reminded too. of one of the 37 practices of the Bodhisattva's sons is avoid the jerk. Sure. Stay away from that person or that, or that negative um, yeah. energy that is going to roil you, that is going to give you a hard time. And so, I mean... That seems to me to be perfectly ethical as well. Absolutely. And again, it's a question of assessing it case by case and, and deciding for yourself, also, is the guy dangerous? I mean, is it, worth, is it worth teaching him a lesson, even if you think you're being compassionate and skillful and bodhisattva-like, if he's going to like pull out a knife or do whatever? You know, yeah, absolutely. You might. It's not worth it. It's not worth it in the big calculation of things. And in terms of other examples, I mean, there's an infinite number of examples where you could raise the question of be being compassionate to yourself. This is something that many of you may know. Uh, Thupten Jimba, who's a brilliant author and a, a, a Tibetan gay, is the translator for the Dalai Lama, Tibetan geishe scholar in his own right, also got a PhD from Oxford and teaches in the university. So he's well-schooled both in Buddhist practice, Buddhist teaching you know, in the formal tradition of the geishe and as well as in the Western. Uh, Oxford tradition. He's written many fantastic books. I recommend all of them very highly. A What's brilliant the translator. His name is Tupton Jimba. Tupton Jimba has a whole series of books that he does uh, 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 published through Wisdom called the uh, Library of Tibetan Classics. He did the Lojong, the whole translation of mind training. He's many, many books. His own dissertation was uh, called Reason, what is it, a long title? Self, Reason, and Something in Reality. It's basically Tsongkhapa's take on Madhyamaka. Brilliant book, really good book for understanding that. He's written a wide range of books. One of the books he just came out with is called A Fearless Heart. And it's his own, uh, I have the book, I've talked to people who've read it, I, I have not read it myself yet. You've read it, so you can tell us. But it's about, among other things, self-compassion. Well, the first two chapters are on self-compassion, yeah. and it's quite stunning. Because he, he, as a Tibetan geishe and also a Western teacher, has come to realize, has come to see that a big, big problem that Westerners in particular have is they, is they really beat up on themselves. And, they, and actually, it's a very appropriate Buddhist response to say, wait a minute, you know, there's nothing wrong with being compassionate to yourself as well. So he writes, I guess, in the first two chapters at length about that. But again, it's something I've heard the Dalai Lama and others speak to. Um, it's a big topic. We could certainly explore it more maybe on the Mahana day about self-compassion. You just have to be careful that self-compassion doesn't morph into self-cherishing. And self-cherishing is the number one thing you're trying to get rid of in lojong, in mind training. So self-grasping, which is a cognitive thing, of, or the self-habit, and then self-cherishing is the affective 
ego habit. Those you, so you need to just distinguish those. But as long as you're not doing that, then self-compassion, of course, is, is very important, actually. So Tupton Jimba, it's a good book, right? Yeah, the other yeah. point he makes is um, if, if, if you can have this like, really um, genuine feeling of self-compassion and gentleness with yourself, there's no basis for you to have it for somebody else. Like you have to, yes. It, it really, once you really get it without the ego, then it, it, it's easier to really have authentic compassion. You have yeah. greater capacity. That makes sense. And I think that, that, make that, that same idea cuts across all topics, which is why I was saying earlier, you have to have developed your own sense of a drive for personal liberation. The fact that the Four Noble Truths sink in personally, you actually understand you're, that you're, you're an addict, like a 12-step meeting, you know, hi, I'm an addict. You know, misknowledge, desire, and hatred, they really drive me, and they really are driving me crazy, they drive me to suffer. But I, really, I do actually see that, and I actually see it's possible to stop doing that. And I've actually had some success at stopping doing that. You have to have had all that experience, right? All the individual vehicle kind of experience to, to have the background, the wisdom, and the, to be able to turn that on someone else and say, oh, I could do this for you too. So just to say, I'm, I'm a Mahanas, I'm a, I, you know, I wish all sentient beings to be Buddhas, and I'm a Bodhisattva. If you don't have the experience yourself, it doesn't mean anything. It's just words. So it's really, it's, I always see it as like a spectrum. It's to the extent that X is the case, or you realize X, to that extent, you're able to do that. You know? So with merit, with karma, with compassion, with liberation, with all these topics, it's to whatever extent you're able to understand this or do this, to that extent, you're able to understand that or do that for yourself or for someone else. So it becomes a path, it becomes a, a, a long process of gradually becoming this more and more in either vehicle. But that's why you know, the, the individual vehicle thing is not trumped by or thrown out with the, it's not you have individual vehicle here, you reject that, and now you become universal vehicle and you're gonna save everybody else. That's why the universal vehicle liberation thing is the core of this. So your own focus on your own liberation, which talk about self-compassion, nothing can be more compassionate to yourself than liberating yourself from your own suffering. So having that at the core of what you're doing as being the basis on which you then launch into the world to try to help others, that becomes you know, a viable way forward. Uh, we have maybe half a minute left. I think there was one other question. Yes. Information. Are the, is the practice is the of the mic on there? I can't tell if it's on. Um, is the practice of the paramitas unique to the Mahayana? Uh, yes. Yes, and we'll discuss really? that on the Mahayana day. It's unique in the sense that as a practice, yes, it is, as a practice. In the Theravada texts, uh, or the, the, the so-called Hinata texts, of course, and in the Jataka tales, there is the notion that the Shakyamuni Buddha was a Bodhisattva, right, before. And so there's discussion of Shakyamuni Buddha having been a Bodhisattva, having practiced the six paramitas, having now become a Buddha, yay. But there's no talk about as a path. Now everyone else, now, well, gee, we should all practice the paramitas as well. So as a, as a description of what Shakyamuni went through, yes, but as a description of the path that you as a practitioner should go through on the individual vehicle, no, the six paramitas are not. The six paramitas are definitely one of the defining characteristics of Mahayana practice. Well, thank you. I hope you can all make it to Jewel Heart um, on Thursday night and continue the conversation. Thanks. Thank you. This video was brought to you in part through the generous monthly support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit our website at tibethouse.us. Together, we can make a difference. Tashi Delek, and thanks for watching.